and we're live. Hello, everyone. Greetings from your friendly ex-Muslim and Abdullah Gondal. How is everyone doing? Uh, it's been a while. It's been a really long time, hasn't it? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me back and welcome back to the Two Abdullah Show. Uh, uh, we've been away for a few months. I've been busy. I've We've been in lockdown, so hope everybody's safe, sound, and healthy. Uh, I've been up to a few things, uh, haven't been uh, uh, staying idle. So today we're going to be talking about uh, continuing on our Islamic nonsense or the circus and Islam presentation. Where we left off last time was around slide 50 out of 100. And we're going to try to get to as much as we can, maybe about slide 80 or so. But then I also want to share with you guys what I have been up to for the past two months and why was I away. Uh, I've been doing some research into the neuroscience and mental health of Muhammad and I have uncovered a lot of references. I think I have more than 150 references that I've from different Islamic books talking about him convulsing. There's like 30 references about him shaking, some about uh, him fainting. Uh, and I've sourced it from Shia and Sunni narration. So we will be going through that in detail. I'll make a whole video about it, uh, probably a documentary style, because the evidence, there's just so much explicit statements about him having full-on uh, convulsive seizures with foam coming out of and froth coming out of his mouth. Uh, but anyways, we will. I will show you some of those sneak peeks uh, at the end. But for now, what we will do is we will... Uh, start off with the, our first slide. <laughs> so let's put that on there so you can see what we have for you here. If, in case you guys don't remember what kind of content this is, we had, I think, flying carpets, talking genies, talking animals, uh, shooting stars, chasing genies, and whatnot. Like, you can get everything. So uh, Samir, would you want to add that to the stream and let's get started? Did you uh, share your screen? I don't see it. Okay, let me share the yeah. screen. Perfect. Oh, and uh, thank you, P, for uh, for coming. And uh, salam and zakat to Abdullah's likes and subscribe <laughs> upon them. We'll rewatch this show later as it's late. Give it up. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. So um, you're going to share. Oh, yeah, you did share the screen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> So the first one we're start uh, starting with today is heart surgery with Zamzam sanitizer. <laughs> Given that it's the pandemic going on, what's funny is like uh, this is narrated that the angels came to me and took me to the Zamzam, and my heart was open and washed with the water of Zamzam, and then I was left at my place. It's quite an interesting narration because this occurs in in, in many early seer books, and this happened when. Uh, uh, Muhammad was once a child when he was like four or five uh, playing with his uh, playmates with his foster parents. And then suddenly these two people came and dressed in white. They uh, ripped open his chest and played with his belly. Then they washed it with Zamzam, placed it back, washed out the... What's funny is they say they washed out the clot of evil inside of his heart or removed the evil or purified him. What's funny is why would you need him to be purified like what was inside of his heart what is this was he was there like original sin some people have pointed out is related to but what's the whole point of uh washing this out then another interesting thing is like if you were to go into the details of this specific incident this incident when happened to him as a child uh we are told that instantly muhammad's uh, foster parents first reaction was the kids going nuts and they put him on the back of a camel and returned him to his mom uh, and this incident then repeats again uh, by the night of the Miraj when the angels come and cut open his chest again. But it's just weird, like these angels are like coming and like doing these open heart surgeries in 7th century Arabia. <laughs> it is strange. Yeah, I don't know. I'm... Why would why would they describe it as cutting the heart and what what do you think is the significance of of saying it that way? Do you think it was some based on where he was feeling pain in his body that he said my heart was cut? Why why would you think it would be described that way? Well, there the the uh, doctor did it because he's a neurologist, and my research into this whole thing, he says that this is one of the most common uh, types of sensations that occur, or as an aura during a seizure, these epigastric risings, and they're accompanied by visceral pain in some parts. So 
during that time and Muhammad is having these pains in his belly, he's hallucinating or he's thinking that there are these people ripping up his body. And you see multiple cases of this and this exact hallucination repeats at least twice. And Muslim scholars speculate it happened more than that, most probably. Uh, some say it even happened once before the revelation began in the cave of Hira. There are some narrations to that. But uh, the epigastric rising uh, is very common. And in fact, if in the further details of this narration, it says that his chest was cut open from here, like his belly, all the way here. And then they took, and in some of them, they bring like a bowl of water of Zamzam and some is like a gold bowl of gold water or something and they wash his heart inside of it and it's just like what is this going on uh the other thing is like why did he see two people again we'll go into more detail in the full presentation that i'm going to prepare for you the doctor Kukut says that it's a uh, diplopia where the people that have this issue they might see two apparitions of two humans as in it uh the nerve fibers cross in the temporal lobes and whatnot. We'll get into that later on, but let's let's move on to the next slide. Let's see what we have. Ooh, 4K projector stream from heaven. This one's interesting. Here it says, the prophet led us in prayer and then went up to the pulpit and beckoned with both hands towards the Qibla of the mosque and said, when I started leading you in prayer, I saw the display of paradise and hell on the wall of the mosque. I never <laughs> saw good and bad as I've seen today. And he repeated the statement three times. So that's that's very interesting. Like this guy's just praying, Alhamdulillah, I mean, and then in front of him, he's like, because the movie's playing where like these guys are being roasted and tortured, or these other people are like playing with hoodies and whatnot, eating pomegranates and <laughs> but like, what is this? Like 4K? I don't know. Nowadays it's like 8K. We got 8K screens, <laughs> OLED, OLED technology, 244 hertz refresh rate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see again and again this thing of repetition of him three times. He actually had an issue of repeating everything a few mm -hmm. times. We'll save that for later. Let's move on to another one and see what's up next. Ah, uh, Abdullah Samir, you love this one, the dungy <laughs> genies. <laughs> this one is just bizarre. Like this one time prophet, you know, like uh, he's trying to poop and he asks his buddy to bring him something to clean his private parts. But he says, don't bring any bones or animal dung. And eventually he brings that. And then the prophet said, they are the food of the jinns. And then he goes on to explain this whole story. The delegate of the jinns of the city of Nasibin came to me and how nice those jinns were <laughs> <laughs> and asked me for the remains of the human food. I invoked Allah for them that they would never pass by a bone or animal dung, but find food on them. Uh, what? Uh, you just have, I have a question. A question. Yes. What was uh jinns eating before the Muhammad? That's what I would like to know. Jinn's been around a long time, you know, since the beginning of creation. You know, Allah created humans, Allah created jinns. Jin Muhammad gave jinns food, but before that, what jinns starving poor jinns and eat food too, you know, like when, that's, a, that's a very good brother asked a very good question because the jinns are made of a fire then like how do they digest do they put the food and it just burns up suddenly <laughs> like how is their digestive system work <laughs> so oh, scholars, scholars actually say that even though the jinns are made of fire um they're not fire because muhammad he grabbed one of them and he was cool he said he felt the coolness <laughs> of <the> spit <laughs> and <laughs> And we're made out of clay, but we're not clay, so. <laughs> oh, so, <boy>. that's the... <laughs> so just because it's made out of fire, it doesn't mean they are fire. You see, you need to learn the proper Islamic theology. Wait, so that explains why we have to pray before we enter the toilet, because when we take a shit, the genie's going to come eat it. <laughs> if you don't pray, <laughs> it's going to attack us. <laughs> <laughs> It is a good question, though. So just to remind people, we are taking the piss, so to speak. We are joking around. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're 
making fun. But why are we doing this? What is the point of making fun? The point is to make, you know, Muslims or anyone that's a believer to reflect and think about, like, one of these things on their own sounds funny, but when you combine all of them together, you have a very dramatic effect, which is you start to to realize that there is so much absurdity in the religion. Like, how is it that this could be from God? Like, do you truly believe this entire, like, circus of Islam, as Abdullah Gandil cleverly called it? Like, is it possible that this is from God? And, you know, like, if someone showed you the same thing, but instead of Allah mentioned um, a different God, what was it? What's your favorite, uh, the one that you wrote on Facebook? Zinu. <laughs> Zinu. If Zinu was the one that had poop eating genies, would you laugh at the religion of Zenu or would you say, damn, that's, I can buy that. Yeah, poop eating genies. Okay, poop and not just poop. They eat bones too, apparently, right? Um, like that. that is kind of what we're trying to get at. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you agree with that? Would, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, and I would add like, for example, if you notice in the Quran, whenever there's, descriptions of uh, things that were happening in front of Muhammad or things that he could directly witness. The descriptions uh, the Quran gives are perfectly fine, you know, and they match reality what we see. But as soon as the Quran tries to speculate about things that are beyond the scope of the humans of that time, let's say, where does the sun go or what orbits what or cosmology or science, that's when it starts airing, right? So you also see like this idea that the Quran will always get the, the easily perceived things right. But anything that's hard to, uh, to describe for the seventh century human, it almost always gets it wrong. And this tells us that it's very human in origin. And it, it gives us a lot of the knowledge that we expect from the day. Uh, also for the miracles. Uh, that's, that's a very good point. I never thought of saying it like that. The things which are easy to know, or I mean, even those, some of them are probably long, but you would expect the Quran to get it right. And But the things that Quran shouldn't have known, it doesn't know, it just gets it totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, for really example, if the Quran is describing, you know, like how the trees or the plants come out of the soil after rain falls or some desert scene, they describe it perfectly fine. But like, let's say when it comes to what are shooting stars, uh, they're chasing spy genies. You can see like where the where the Quran's let's say uh, upper limit of knowledge is. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good uh, point. Okay, I'm gonna add it back to the screen. All right, so we finished the genies that eat the dungs. Let's see, cave boy passed out with dog for three hundred years. So this this is like from Surah Kahf, and this is one of the most weirdest chapters. Uh, on its own because the revelation story of this chapter is like Muhammad was asked these three, four questions by these uh, Jews, I believe, or Ahlul Kitab. And then he said, yeah, I'll give you the answer in a few days. And then two, three weeks passed and then nobody oh, yeah, yeah. gave yeah, any what answers. What happened was uh, the, the Arab polytheists, apparently hmm. according to the story, they wanted to trap Muhammad in, an, in a question they wasn't able to answer. So they asked, the Jews for some information about some because they were considered the learned people. And so mm -hmm. he they asked those people, like, what can we ask him that he wouldn't know? And of course, he didn't know the story of Dul Khanain. He actually like he couldn't come up with it for many days, right? Which is which so they actually got him. And the funny thing is to me that in this whole story, um, is the fact that they won. Like this completely destroys Islam, this surah. This surah has so many mm -hmm. mistakes in it. And the obvious plagiarism from, you know, if like the, the, the pre-Islamic Arabs, like we should thank them for asking Muhammad to answer this question. Because of mm -hmm. this, he exposed himself so badly that the entire thing just fell apart, you know? Yeah, and the funniest thing is that the origins of this story, the seven sleepers, if... Uh... Uh, Pifias or whatever they're called, uh, they're actually regarded as a forged legend, even uh, according to Christianity. They know it's a false belief. Like, it's not real. The seven sleepers of uh, Ephesus. It's, mm -hmm. yeah. And 
Muslims, well, at that time, Muhammad just kind of copied over and he just put it out with, and he didn't even give thought that, okay, even the Christians consider this forged. And I mean, it's quite a ridiculous story when you think about this. Uh, you go to this cave and there these guys go to sleep in a cave for 300 some years with their dog who's guarding the entrance of the cave. And it's just, just completely bizarre. So, and then there's a c issue with like how many even were there. So some say there were three, some say there's four, fifth being their dog, five, six being their dog, seven, eighth being their dog. And then Allah says, I'm the only one who knows nobody knows except a few. So do not argue about them, <laughs> about their number. <laughs> so I want to talk about this for a second, this thing. This is interesting. I remember as a Muslim taking a class with uh, Muhammad al-Sharif and Muhammad al-Sharif I think it was Muhammad al Sharif. Anyways, he mentioned that this is a sh this shows you how the Quran includes only the most important details. It doesn't include details that we don't need to know, such as how many were there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like this is actually a point in 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 favor of the Quran that the Quran doesn't mention how many people are in the story. And um, yeah, it's pretty pretty interesting that they were actually asking him how many people were in the cave and he you know basically said my lord knows how many were in the cave is this maybe this was one of the instances where he didn't want to get caught in his you know in 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 contradicting the other story but of course if he would have he would have just said yeah that one's corrupted which is basically <laughs> the get out of jail card right yasa yeah. sarajma says i say there were 15. okay there you go <laughs> Oh, Why don't you count the numbers then, stupid Allah? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. No, Allah knows the number. He just doesn't want to tell us because it's irrelevant. It's relevant that these, um, you know, seven people slept in a cave for 300 years. That's relevant. There was a <laughs> dog. <laughs> the dog turned over in his sleep. <laughs> All of that's oh, relevant. Man. But it's the number just... is not relevant. Oh, boy. And like, if you read at the bottom here, let me just get the pointer out. Is it says that the 300 years were like the solar years, but then Allah mentions just out of his generosity, 300 <laughs> plus nine for the lunar years. Like, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> What's funny is you were talking about Muhammad uh, not trying to give a very getting caught. Yeah. Amongst those three questions they asked him, one was about the soul. Like yeah. asked him about the soul. That don't ask me about the soul. It's only your Lord's matter. He knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he just like bailed on that question completely. <laughs> but it's funny, man. Like this story. When you read this whole chapter, like I'm just thinking about it. The 300 caves. Then this Alexander guy comes in, goes to the east, finds this people burnt up by the sun. Then the west finds it setting in a pond, builds this metal cave wall to come like to, Oh, Gog and Mag Oh my God! So <laughs> it's like uh, Avengers, eh? Like the yeah. last, the last episode. Of Avengers. <laughs> All right, let's move Thanos, on. Thanos is basically uh, Gog and Mag Gog. <laughs> He's gonna come back. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> naked I most. Go back in time and fix this. <laughs> Naked Moses in a stone that steals clothes. Oh boy, this story is kills me. This is in Surah Ahzab, this verse. And it talks about when Moses was accused. So there says, the Prophet said the people of Bani Israel used to take baths naked altogether. So we know that people back in the day used to have these communal baths looking at each other. Romans, Greeks, pretty common. The most Prophet Moses used to take a bath alone. So the people started wondering, oh, why is he hiding? Right, nothing prevents Moses from taking a bath with us, except that he has a scrotal hernia. So it was speculated that Moses is not taking baths with people in public because he has a scrotal hernia. <laughs> uh, so once Moses went out to take a bath and put his clothes over a stone, so this guy's taking a bath and just tosses his clothes over this rock that's on the side, the stone just ran away with his clothes. Like what? <laughs> So Moses is then just running after the stone saying, my clothes, oh stone, my clothes. <laughs> Till the people of Bani Israel saw Moses running around naked, chasing this rock with his clothes. <laughs> and then they realize 
by Allah, Moses has got no scrotal hernia. His balls are all fine. We were wrong in <laughs> assuming he had issues with his ball sack. <laughs> <laughs> what, and what's, Moses that was, what's that called when you go out and you uh, like expose yourself for uh, public it, nudity? <laughs> <laughs> like Allah's promoting, uh, <laughs> like. Oh man! <laughs> People to see, like it's it's, weird. it's such a strange story that why why does um why didn't Allah just say that like you know okay Moses why why does Moses need to prove to people that he doesn't have a thing on his balls like why is that even important <laughs> enough to to embarrass him and humiliate him to be naked with this rock that's chasing around the the towel or whatever <laughs> I know it just gets worse yeah. when Moses catches the stone. He took his clothes and then he's like, oh, you bad stone. You bad stone. <laughs> <laughs> he started to beat the stone. <laughs> and Abu Huraira is like, screw this. I'm going to take it even further. There are still six or seven marks present on the stone from the excessive beating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, oh, this. this. <laughs> Was he beating it with the miswak? <laughs> Oh, this is, this is an interesting comment here. Maybe doctors should start surgically removing evil from heart. <laughs> Why do we do research into this fully understood uh, discipline? <laughs> oh, this is the best comment ever. He beat it lightly. <laughs> Chapter 4, <five>, verse 34. <laughs> he beat it lightly. With the miswalk, that's where the miswalk comes from. Exactly. It comes from Moses, the Sunnah of Moses, to beat the stone lightly with the miswalk. Like, I, I'm just baffled. Like, who was writing when Bukhari wrote this? What the hell was he thinking, my guy? Like, think about it. I'm just writing a book and I'm going to write about, yeah, Moses had an issue with his balls. Oh, yeah, this one day the rock ran away with his clothes and then he chased it and then he beat the rock up and the people saw his balls were all fine. <laughs> Why don't not it tell you the intellect or the, the, the level of the mentality of these Islamic scholars who write this book and who thought that this nonsense is worthy to be sanctified in the second most plausible authentic book after the quran think about this why, why don't the muslims make cartoons of these things these are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know those kids cartoons they should be cartoons from bukhari uh, maybe we could start a gofundme and get money to make some cartoons for, for muslim kids <laughs> <laughs> muslims can pay us <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> we'll say it as seriously as possible but we know the kids will be laughing so it'll be much more spent <laughs> Uh, oh, let's yeah. go with the next one. Exhibitionism. That's, that's, what, the, that's what I was. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Allah is an ex exhibitionist of Moses. <laughs> Here, look at my beautiful prophet with no defects in his body. I'll make him run naked in the streets to prove it. <laughs> oh, All right, we come to the infamous. That the moon has split into two. The moon was split into two pieces while we were with the Prophet in Mina, and he said, Be witnesses. And a piece of the moon went towards the mountain. Now, another interesting bit is that we do see uh, in some narrations in the Seer of Ibn Kasir that this was actually just a uh, an eclipse of the moon and not actually the splitting of the moon. And in fact, there are some uh, uh, calculations that do show that there was indeed a big eclipse of the moon that happened in Muhammad's time, which could have been mistaken like this. Uh, so that's that. Now let us move to the next slide. Okay, the crying tree stem loves Muhammad. <clears throat> This one's funny where the prophet used to stand by a stem of a date palm tree delivering the sermon and the pulpit was placed for him. We heard a tree stem crying like a pregnant she camel. Like, so there's this tree stump and like, and then it just starts screaming like a camel. <laughs> because it's, and if you go in the other narration, they tell you that it was sad because Muhammad's pulpit was changed from the usual spot. They had a new pulpit made for him. So this 
it was sad that Muhammad is going to be further away from me. So the tree was sad for that and started crying. Like some of the stuff that leaks into these books is just absolutely hilarious. Okay. Yeah, that is pretty hilarious. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on to the next one. I think we should take us a, a call or two soon. Yeah. Oh, wait, I forgot. I'll put the link again. This is proof that Islam brings joy. <laughs> this one is one of my favorite ones. The knockout <laughs> eye, the boxing match he has with the angel of death. It's like he pulls out a Muhammad Ali. <laughs> 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 so this is just, just mind boggling. So the angel of death came to Moses and said, respond to the call of Allah. Moses, peace be upon him, gave him a blow at the eye of the angel of death and knocked it out. So Mo angel comes up, Moses like, F you, boom. And he knocks the angel's eye out. So the angel is like, oh, my eye, oh no. So he runs back to Allah <laughs> and says, you sent me to your servant who does not like to die. And he knocked out my eye. So Allah restored his eye to his proper place. What the hell? So the angel has a physical eye that Moses firstly could punch, secondly could damage and knock it out. And the angel has to return to God to get it fixed. Like it makes no sense whatsoever. It's crazy. Yeah, that is pretty crazy. <laughs> All right. And then the other thing, too, is like the whole idea of even giving uh, Moses, like he has a choice, like mm -hmm. he has a choice. He wants to die or not. I mean, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, how does Moses get a choice to pick if he can die or not? Like, what yeah. the hell? Yeah. It, it then says, uh, go to my servant and say, do you want life? So now Allah is talking to the <laughs> angel and telling him, go ask Moses, does he want to live or die? After telling him to go and kill him. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> uh, and then, and in case you want, like, keep your hand on the body of the ox. So you have a cow, just put your hand on top of it, and you would live such number of years as the number of your, like, the hair your hand falls on. So, for example, if your hair falls on, like, uh, about 100 hairs or 200 hairs, you're going to live that long. <laughs> It's like a lottery. <laughs> yeah, it just makes no sense. He, Moses, says, what then? Uh, then you would die. Whereupon Moses says, and why not now? And then Allah caused me to die, blah, blah, blah. And then, the cr like, I don't even know what the hell this last part even means. <laughs> Had I been there that place, I would have been shown his grave by the side of the path at the Red Mound. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> you know, it's interesting how there's a lot of these hadith with where Muhammad adds this like hypothetical near the end. Mm -hmm. For example, like uh, he's talking about how with Zamzam, he says, you know, uh, may Allah have mercy on Haja because she she started gathering up the water. If she wouldn't have done that, it would have been like this massive like you know spring. But because she went and she like <laughs> messed with it. Now it's just like, you know, this little spring or something. And it's, he, he adds these little, like, hypotheticals. If I was there, you know, <laughs> I, would have, I would have seen it. <laughs> what? Well, you, the whole story of that, the, the Zamzam is so messed up because Gabriel apparently in, comes in and then strikes his heel on the ground. And suddenly, like, the water erupts. This is so bizarre. And, and like, what, is, is this saying that Moses is buried in some, like, random place? I guess that's what he's saying, right? Because it was he wanted to be close to some sacred land or something, right? Yeah. It's just, it's just like such silly, relevant details. <laughs> oh, boy. Our favorite one, the dipping the house fly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Prophet said, if a house fly falls in the drink of any one of you, he should dip it in the drink and take it out. For one of its wings has a disease and the other has the cure for the disease. Now, this is just... Don't follow this advice at all. Like, <laughs> bad, bad, bad advice. If a fly falls in your drink, throw the drink out, probably get a new drink. Uh, Muhammad would, had no clue how germs and how this works. Like, no, you don't dip fly wings. They carry way too much flies going all sorts of places. It's just contamination. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> just, to, just to make this a little bit more obvious, Muhammad sort of, 
um, you know, trapped himself here because, assuming he said it, this hadith is very clearly saying one wing has the disease and one has a cure. It just doesn't work like that. Like there's no there's no means for like a disease to be on one wing <laughs> than a cure. Like if it, because I know that there's Muslims now that are saying that um, fly wings and uh, not house flies, maybe like dragonfly. There's a certain type of fly. I think dragonflies or something. Mm -hmm. They have uh, antibiotic surface on the wings or something like that. There's some mm -hmm. sort of like thing going on in science where you there's some wings that are like, but that doesn't mean you eat it. <clears throat> you can't. That isn't exactly. like. You know I mean, there's a surf. If a surface has some sort of and like let's say I put rubbing alcohol on my on my surfaces, I'm not gonna eat that. Like mm -hmm. if there's some sort of you know chemical on the wing of a fly that prevents the disease or whatever, that doesn't mean you swallow it or whatever. And and even then, it wouldn't make sense if one of the wing would have it and the other one. Would. There's no way out of yeah. this. Uh, Islam just making uh, flies famous again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the other funnier things is that uh, uh, a lot of people confuse that the, there was a study where Muslims cited where the flies wing did have the antibody, but they don't understand. This is very, very, very important. This happens with the camel urine hadith too, where Muslim scientists have done studies in camel urine and its effect on controlling cancer and whatnot. They have to realize that they, when they take a sample, they then isolate a compound mm -hmm. within the urine, purify and extract it, and then use just that specific purified compound to test on it. So it's for it's the equivalent of me saying that, let's say, okay, human blood has nutrition in it. Well, okay, if I'm taking out, let's say, some specific uh, thing, but if you say, oh, eat human blood, no, or drink human blood, well, I'm going to tell cause people to have all sorts of bad diseases and whatnot, right? And like cross diseases and bloodborne diseases and whatnot. But the point is that isolating a compound and then using it is vastly different from taking a fly and then dunking it in the thing. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So let's go. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me, let me see this. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, on the Dawa scene, the prophet had such an understanding of history that he must have been genuine or secretly had the library of Alexandria. <laughs> it's so oh true. <laughs> Man, like his history class. <laughs> I, I killed my neighbor's dog by fly house wing. <laughs> oh my god. <clears throat> All right, let's go to the next one. Yeah. Halal genetics come harder. This is a very famous one where uh, this Jew, <clears throat> Abdullah bin Salam, heard the news of Muhammad's arrival. And he was a far on a farm and he said, I will ask you about three things which nobody knows, okay, unless he be a prophet. So firstly, how does Abdullah bin Salam himself know these things if he's not a prophet? What the hell? So he knows these things, but apparently only a prophet should know them. <laughs> firstly, what is the first portent of the hour? What is the first meal of the people of paradise and what makes a baby look like it? So these th three questions to, to find out if Muhammad is a real prophet or not. It's a good good. Like you said, how is this falsifiable? Exactly. How would you... Okay, the first meal of the people of paradise is Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you're not a prophet. It's Indian food. How would how well, would anyone... like you know, it's, it's like when my kids ask me, what's 451 <laughs> times 732? And I'm like, 48,621. And they <laughs> look at me like, wow. I'm like, you... There's no way you can check that anyway. So... <laughs> <laughs> like you don't have a calculator, right? So, uh, well, this is just something very funny that happens. Like when he asks, and what makes a baby look like its father or mother? So this is genetics, right? And the prophet suddenly says, "Gabriel has now informed me about that." Abdullah said, "Gabriel." <laughs> prophet said, "Yes." And then Abdullah said, "He among the angels is the enemy of the Jews." Like, why do you have to tell this? The first thing Gabriel comes and tells you, "Hate the Jews." <laughs> wow. And Abdullah bin Salam was a uh, was a Jew. <laughs> he was a Jew, right? Like jeez. He among the <laughs> angels is the enemy of the Jews. And that the Prophet recited the holy Wait, verse. What? I thought you were the chosen people. Or like Allah has blessed them and sent them so many prophets. And what's going on here? <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I know what this is. This is because there was somebody that's there was some so some I think somebody was saying that uh something bad about Gabriel or something or Mikhail or something, and then this is why the list was coming down. There was some like bad bad stuff going between the different they were like cussing each other's angels or something. <laughs> cussing angel cussing words <laughs> i think so i think that's what if i Ooh, remember there is there is because that's why it's saying, you know he among the angel angels is the enemy of the jews what whoever's an angel because the second part whoever's <laughs> an enemy to gabriel so th that's the point i recognize i don't remember the other part about enemy of the jews that's crazy oh my god <laughs> Um, it's just so funny. Like Gabriel comes up, and like I hate Jews, by the way. Just, just, just get. I know out of the way. that's awful. I mean, and people <clears throat> wonder. This is, like, this is straight up anti-Semitism. Like, we're just gonna. Oh we yeah. Gotta, we gotta call it out right here. This is what it is. This yeah. is anti-Semitism. <clears throat> like, this is clear anti-Semitism. <laughs> this is not cool at all. But anyways, yeah, we're just going through the historical YouTube. If you're watching this, we are discussing historical references from islamic sources we are not saying this we believe this <laughs> oh this is a good thing just making it clear <laughs> yeah anyways let's move to like what the answers he gives muhammad so he says as for the first portion of the hour portion of that it will be a fire that will collect the people from the east to the west so i guess it'll be like a ring of fire kind of like <laughs> PUBG or like fortnite where it closes or like war zone <laughs> And you have to run in the circle. <laughs> oh my God! It's not predicted Fortnite. <laughs> and as for the first meal of the people of paradise, it will be caught at I extra lobe of the fish liver. What? Yeah, I don't know. Fish liver. It's kind of. I don't know why that's significant. So <laughs> it's got a lot of like uh, good uh, oil, like the omega oils. Omega yeah. Three six nine is good oh for. Oh my God! Brain. It's not predicted omega three. <laughs> <laughs> But this is the, this is what takes the cake. We don't need that in paradise, <laughs> right? He's not saying eat it now. He's saying we're gonna eat that in paradise. I guess you can... <laughs> this one, when I first found out, I mean, I studied biology and like that's my what I've been studying. And like, I I was like, how wrong could you get genetics? Like, the guy asks, what does makes a baby resemble either of the parents? And Muhammad says, if a man comes discharges before the woman then the child resembles the father and if the woman comes or discharges before the man then the child resembles the mother like this is not how it works <laughs> it doesn't matter who comes first it's not gonna make the child look like the mother or the father more it's not yeah, how it works not, i mean just to be explicit too it's not like unless unless muhammad is talking about squirting women don't like like it's not like that. I mean, the 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 fluid is there continuously. It's not like one fluid that comes out like with the man, right? So unless he was watching some, I don't know what he was watching back then. There wasn't that stuff didn't exist. <laughs> but. but yeah, and then he goes on that suddenly upon hearing this, Abdullah bin Salam, that guy, he suddenly accepts, uh, uh, like uh, Islam all of a sudden. <laughs> I'm like, what? So anyways, <laughs> this is weird. Then the Jew said, Abdullah is the worst of us. And then his, their own scholar becomes like the worst, most hated scholar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. This is, um, this is, reminds me of something. This is, reminds me of, you know what this reminds me of? This mm -hmm. is, reminds me of Cactus Boy. When he was Muslim, everybody was praising him. And as mm -hmm. soon as he left Islam, oh, no, 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 no. He wasn't a real Muslim. It's, uh, it's predicted in hadith the same thing <laughs> hilarious i mean uh, okay let's move to the next one. Oh, the most famous one the sun sets in the pond and this one has started so much controversy so as we know like muhammad he when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it as a setting in a spring of dark mud, and he found near it a people. Allah said, O oh, Dhulkarnain, either you punish them or else adopt them a way of goodness. So a lot of controversy surrounds this verse, and people might say, like, well, it's like it's from his perspective. It's not like it actually uh, went and said in the pond. Uh, so we have this hadith here on the side, which you can see. 
I narrated by Abu Dhar, I was sitting behind the messenger of Allah who was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. He asked, do you know where this sets? I replied, Allah and his apostle know best. He said, it sets in a spring of warm water. Now, this uh, is a Sahih and chain. Then another version of it occurs in Jamia Sagira Sahih as well. And uh, I think Alambani authenticated it. And if you want to go into more details, you can look at the, the Masked Arabs video. And there's also some tafsirs in the early Muslim scholarship where uh, they actually did take it completely literally. Let me see if I can find that one out for you where they actually argue that no it is in fact fully se setting inside a pond and then one of the scholars says that uh, how can the earth not be flat if it wasn't flat the water wouldn't stay it would fall out <laughs> yeah i made a whole thread about flat earth uh, let me just get that. All right, I can't find it right now. I didn't realize I was muted. Sorry, I was going to oh. say um, <laughs> this. So it was likely, I mean, it's very obvious that this is what Muhammad believes, but this is what is plausible, that Muhammad believed the earth was flat. There was edges of the earth. And what actually swung me over from thinking as a Muslim that this is one possible interpretation, but obviously the wrong one, to this is the likely interpretation and, and the wrong one, is the fact that when I looked into it, I realized that this is what the people of the time believed in this area, right, in, mm -hmm. in Arabia. So the fact is that Muhammad probably thought that, most, most, most likely. And that's what it seems to say. I mean, what other conclusion are you going to come up with? Oh, no, that's mm -hmm. not what it means. It means what we think today, which is it's just the way you look at it. Or, you know, that's just a figure of speech or a metaphor. or It's just a, an observation or what. It, that part of that information that, that was added to me was what swung me over the edge to, to actually consider that, no, this is not what I thought it was. I don't know if you guys can see, uh, I just opened up my Twitter, I made a long thread about this. So I found a lot of scholars, so when Muslims say that it's a well-known thing that almost all big scholars had agreed that Sejma, that the earth is round, that's actually very far away from the truth. You'll see that I found all these books uh, with the names, the dates of the, the scholars, how, when they lived, and the Arabic quotations and with the translation. So Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi said that <clears throat> he called it Bisata and contrary to the allegations of the philosophers and astrologers who say that the earth is round and not flat. He believed the earth is flat. Uh, and then here we have Abu Muhammad al-Andalusi al-Kahtani, 11th century scholar. He says, and the earth in the reckoning of the rightly guided is flat and their evidence is the truthful and clear Quran. Uh, we have Al Mawardi, and he who spread the earth, which means he spread it so that things may lie flat on it, which is a counter argument against those who claim that it is round like a ball. So let me uh, just interject for one second. So we're mm -hmm. not just to make it clear. We're not saying because so and so Abu Hayyam in whatever the 12th century or 13th century said the earth is flat, therefore it must be that the Quran is saying the earth is flat. We are saying that look at all of these scholars these knowledgeable people who know arabic who know the quran and this is what they believed if that is the case then what does that say about the quran is it mm -hmm. clear and is it possible that this is actually what it's saying right mm -hmm. that's what we're saying i mean that's that's a stronger point than just saying because if you just say that oh this because this so-and-so scholar said it so it must be true well you could just say the scholar is wrong Okay, but then why are there so many scholars that believe this? Exactly. How is it possible <clears throat> that God's last and final revelation is so ambiguous that you could be so badly misinterpreted mm -hmm. by the experts of that subject material? And what's worse is these aren't like old scholars. Look at this scholar. He died in 1890. So he's like in the past 200 years. And he said the earth is flat from the Quran. 
You see Shaukani, he's very recent too, in the past 300 years. He says the earth is spread out, excellent. And that is a counter argument to those who claim it's like a ball. Like these Shaukani are people is that, uh, famous. Yeah. Like, and he's well saying in scholar. Uh, Muhammad Yusuf Al Kafi, another, he's in, he died in 1969. And he's saying that the Quran indicates that, you know, it's not like round. I mean, you know, the, the scholars that are in the 1900s that are saying this are even more evidence that the Quran is wrong because they're going against all of the science and knowledge available at the time. And they're still saying this, mm -hmm. which shows you just how strongly they believe this. Like exactly. we're not talking like, and again, these are scholars. We're not just talking some random idiot on Facebook. Like that this guy? Hey, hey, flat earther. Like, you know, not those type of, these are scholars, man. Like these this guy's guy is 20th century. He's yeah. he he died in the 1990s, and he said I the mean, earth is flat. I mean, pretty much, I think like any knowledgeable Muslim knows Shaukani. Like we're mm -hmm. not it's not just like obscure names. I mean, some of them I don't know, but some of them are pretty mainstream names. Mm -hmm. And this is the one I wanted to show you. Uh, Ibn Al Akshid, presumably he's a 10th century scholar. He was his. Uh, opinion was recorded about this uh, verse and it says this of course can only happen on a flat earth it does set it exactly as the quran says so this guy literally took the what the quran says as true he said no it actually sits in a pond as we confirmed from the narrations earlier even ibn mujahid huge scholar ibn mujahid the same guy the seven ahruf guy very famous we've been talking about his name recently he says the opinion that the earth is round is a false one. But believing that it's flat is the obvious meaning taken from the book of Allah, which there is no falsehood. Shahid is a huge scholar too. Yep. He says if the earth were round, then the water would not lie still. Here we have Ibn Abbas trying to say that there are seven layers of flat earths above each other. Here's Imam Jafar Sadiq, and they keep talking about the veil carrying the earth. Um, so Imam Jafar Sadiq is one of the Shia Imams, and he's also yeah. considered a Sunni scholar as well, right? Yeah. Uh, Jalaluddin Suyuti, huge scholar, huge scholar of the Quran, wrote the whole uh, Itqan fil al Quran, huge, huge guy. Also wrote Tafsir al Jalalain, in which he mentions that uh, explicitly that he believes, and most people of the revealed law believe that the earth is flat not round ibn atiyah again another guy who says 88 20 look or something that again it's flat abdullah al qurtabi again says flat and they're actually arguing and giving verses countering that and jazai fakhradin al razi even said that it's oh my god okay, damn it and and we have the veil and whatnot but this is what i wanted to show you as well the hadith about the taghrubu fi ayn hamiyah the sun literally sets in a pond of warm water has authentic and sayyid jamia sagheer so kind of digressed a little bit there <laughs> well let's get back to uh Let's get Slide. back to the thing. But that was pretty cool though, seeing how many scholars like just say it's explicitly just flat. Like it's not a slam dunk case. Yeah, we know that there's a few like they've been Taymiyyah, Ibn Hazm that said it, but they you can't claim a consensus on this issue because I showed you like 20 scholars kind of challenging that. Yeah, this would make a great YouTube video. It's just mm -hmm. uh, just showing that the greatest and the best minds couldn't figure out I couldn't even agree on what the Quran is saying about something as obvious as the shape of the earth. Mm -hmm. Something that people before Islam knew. Before Islam, they knew. They were coming up with information and knowledge about the shape of the earth. Yet, Muhammad in the backwaters of Arabia mm -hmm. obviously didn't know. So so we would be amazed if he did know. We would, we would be <laughs> impressed at some... To some extent, we would say at least he got that right. <laughs> but mm -hmm. even that, he didn't get right. <laughs> even that's wrong. Oh, yeah, you got your slides, Eddie. Okay, let me just show okay. you. Marley, go away. My black <laughs> Satan Dougie is here. <laughs> the, the black genie. <laughs> okay, Marley, go. Oh, yeah, your, your dog is muddy. Yeah. 
my, my cat is Marlo. <laughs> Marlo and Marley. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the other slide. Uh, so continuing on from the, the nonsense about the flat earth, the sun setting in the pond, we have a continuation from Sahih al-Bukhari. The sun prostrates under the throne of Allah every night. So <clears throat> we go on. Prophet asked me, son, said, do you know where the sun goes? I replied, Allah and his, his prophet know best. He said, it goes till it prostrates itself underneath the throne and then takes the permission to rise again. And it is permitted. And then a time will come when it will be about to prostrate itself, but its prostration will not be accepted. And it will ask permission to go on its course, but it will not be permitted. It will be ordered to return once it's come. And then it says, This is the tafsir of the worst, where it says that the sun literally goes underneath the throne of Allah, goes do sajda, and then ask Allah, can I rise again? And then Allah like, okay, okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's, this is it. And then uh, in one other narration, I believe it says that uh, the day of Qiyamah will come and the whole vest sun rising thing is going to happen. Allah will not allow it to rise and tell it to go rise from the place you set and hence it'll rise from the west and then it'll be the end of the world. <laughs> But just shows you how little he knew about what is actually going on. Yeah, I'm just going to highlight this comment. In ancient Greece, there were three philosophers and one that got as far as Earth orbiting the sun. So mm -hmm. talking um, not geocentric, but heliocentric model. This, there mm -hmm. was knowledge, you know, being... And the funny thing is, if the people at that time in Arabia knew this, mm -hmm. guaranteed the Quran would have been more clear about this. Guaranteed. Oh yeah, only because only because they didn't. Now we have Muslim scholars to this day, and I mean, let's let's be let's be honest that the majority of modern scholars do not say the Earth is flat. This is a very mm -hmm. niche interpretation today. Today, you only find basically the extreme Salafis that say the Quran says there's a flat Earth, and mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. I mean, you have to really be blind to like the obvious. And, you know, like there's so much evidence that the earth is not flat. I mean, it's a joke. It's even a joke to say the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. But despite that, these scholars said that. However, the point is that, you know, there should be nobody. If, if it wasn't for the fact that Muhammad thought this, nobody would say this today. Mm -hmm. Like nobody. No, no Muslim scholar would ever say that. They're only saying this because of the book. That's the only reason. The same way that you have these like really... I don't know, I guess they're really extreme Christians that believe in a young earth. Like the only reason they're saying that is because of the Bible. There's no reason to think that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a situation where it's one plausible interpretation is so badly wrong, ask yourself, is this truly from God? Right? Exactly. No, I totally agree. <clears throat> And just to remind people, you can call in. Uh, we still have a bit of time left. If you'd like to call in, whether you're Muslim or atheist, ex-Muslim, Christian, whatever, feel free to call in and uh, and we can have a conversation with you. The link is below. I'll paste it again so you can copy paste it. And uh, most welcome. Okay, go ahead. All right. Let's go to the next one. Hair and grave torture for taking the piss. So this one is very weird. And I just... Uh, find this completely bizarre that the prophet would be just you know walking in the graveyard and then uh he would hear people being tortured and then he would tell others that oh i hear them you can't hear them but you know what we want to know why they're being tortured one of them he had <laughs> urine on his clothes why would what's the big deal like <laughs> if you have urine drops and yeah okay why would god torture you if the piss is so impure well it's inside inside your bladder like it's you know like this ritualistic obsession yeah. with purity has a neurological uh, uh link too we call this scrupulosity we're aware people with certain kinds of issues like muhammad who have epilepsy can develop ocd or certain tendencies where they obsess over minuscule things and ritualistic purities, obsessive washing and hygiene. Uh, Muhammad all, had all of this. And uh, one of the issues here is like, uh, he uh, keeps talking about urine and other hadith, he says that people go uh, get tortured explicitly that uh, 
drops of urine. Uh, then yet apparently, we, yet apparently you can drink camel urine according to the same book. Exactly. Yeah, that that's so weird. Your human urine, if it falls on your clothes, it'll get you tortured in the grave. You can drink camel urine. But then another thing, remember, I, I think you posted this on Twitter, where if a baby boy oh, pisses yeah. on top of you, you just <laughs> sprinkle water on his pee. But if it's a baby girl, you have to wash it. Why is the difference, right? It's completely bizarre. Yeah, and, and like you make a very good point, which is this is coming out of the human body. And, you know, for for men, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, I don't know, it's kind of embarrassing, but like, one of my Muslim friends taught me that, like, you're supposed to really shake it off. Like, you know, you know, you 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 know that what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, right? yeah. That books are going on it, man. That's weird. Yeah. They'll yeah, just... like you have to like <laughs> shake it out extra, shake it, do some extra shakes. And you know, non-Muslims they don't do that, but Muslim men, they have to like really make sure that all of it. Even one of my friends, it's it's embarrassing to even mention this now. <laughs> He's like, you should jump. You know, like I do do a little jump when you're done, so that all of it comes out. You know, because well, we I want it. <laughs> I saw an Islamic scholar in Pakistan recently given a khutbah, man, and he was telling you how to urinate properly. And he said that you can stand on like your heel and then go like, <laughs> like calf extensions. So you go up and down. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Islam makes you healthy. You do calf extensions after taking a piss. <laughs> <laughs> it's bizarre. Like, you know, there's books written on this, right? Like, and there's like people have written quite a, I've, I've read two books, man. I read two books just on Miswak. <laughs> Did it include a chapter on 434? <laughs> <laughs> Prophet uses a beating with the Miswak. Uh, well, yeah, some things people write about your religion is like, well, it is not. It's not that deep, bro. <laughs> yeah, and and like the fact is, excuse me, that the the male organ, like, like some pee comes out sometimes, like a little bit. Like it's not it's not designed to be like you know what i mean the way it's it's like that's just the way god made it if you believe in god so it's it's kind of weird right like he's adding all these like it's kind of like when you sleep you drool right at least most yeah. people drool when they sleep mm -hmm. that's like god saying i will curse you if you drool on your clothes while you sleep like what like why <laughs> would you do that and even the whole thing about circumcision <clears throat> You're supposed to like you God gave you this thing that you're supposed to cut off. Like what? <laughs> right? Like I remember last time we talked about this where Abraham, an 80-year-old guy, took an axe and chopped his own penis off. <laughs> that's the sunnah, that's the story. Yeah. But anyways, an interesting thing then happens is after Muhammad tells them, you know, the urine is getting them tortured, he then takes a green leaf of a date palm tree, split it into two pieces, and then fixed one on each grave. So he just like yeah, so I'll just take a leaf, rip it, and just put it on top of the graves. And then he's, why have you done so that people are like, what the hell are you doing, man? Like, first you tell me you hear dead people being tortured. Then you say they're being tortured for taking the piss. And then you're putting leaves on their graves to lessen their punishment till the leaf becomes dry. <laughs> what the hell is this? Oh, um, does... one more thing before we take the call. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, finish what you're saying, and then I want to add one thing is like how does this make any sense i hope that their punishment may be lessened till the leaf becomes dry how does putting a leaf on top of a grave for on top of a person's grave who's been tortured for leaking urine help his torture being lessened like what's oh my God. what's the thought process going on here it's completely that's a delusional. Great point that's a great point like god designed men to be leaky then he tortures them for not doing extra careful shaking shaky shaky <laughs> then the leaf or the stick or whatever is supposed to undo so muhammad is undoing god's torture for his faulty design like what it's like a self ref it's like a self-referencing stupidity circle yeah which, like, you know <laughs> um one more thing i just wanted to add which was you mentioned this before but like do you not see like this obvious obsession with torture and punishment like seeing in the mosque seeing people being tortured walking by graves thinking people are tortured but where is this coming from exactly like there's this whole thing where i'll talk about this is the quran is obsessed and pivoted at this uh thing of, of uh 
like psychotic, like sadistic torture where, you know, chains, hooks, boiling oil, boiling water, thorny plants, everything, whatnot, and constantly threatening people with the uh, being roasted in hell. And then it doesn't end just, I mean, okay, torture in hell, okay, no. You get tortured in your grave too, man. Like it's a uh, getting a little enough for what? For for piss. But anyways, it's just it's just a weird thing that it also comes from a perspective of like his his mental health and why this happens. Uh, but that we will discuss in our later stream. Let's okay. take you want, you want to take a call it? Yeah, uh, sure. One dawa is on the stream. Mm -hmm. Hi, hello. Hi. Ahlan, Ahlan. Hey, how's it going? So, so um, my question is actually to both of you. By the um, way, are you the one dawa that's on Twitter? Yes, that's me. Okay. Hey, so, you're going? The Salam, man. <laughs> so my question is actually, why are you guys not uh, open for debates? Like, oh my I've god, issued, like for example, <sighs> Gandhi, who um, I arranged like a debate with you, but you suddenly blocked me, and uh, the same thing goes for uh, Abdullah Samir, you know. Yeah, like I'll are ask. you guys afraid of debates of wh okay. what what is it exactly? You know, I'll take this. I'll take this question. I I thought you'd actually have an actual question regarding the content, but no, uh, it is actually because it, it okay, is. I'll, like answer in question. I'll answer your question. I'll answer your question. Debate, you know, like so, I'm trying to I'll be like civilized. Okay, 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 okay. Keeping I'll answer your question. question. The, the reason why I don't want to talk to you specifically is because you're obnoxious. And I don't like the way you engage and the way you attack. You and the way... Can you tell me what, what you I mean? Can, with if you really want, I can, okay, so just to be clear, everyone has the right to decide who they want to talk to and who they want to engage with. Farid blocked me. Ali Dawa blocked me. Okay. Sure, but I'm not they Ali Dawa. The right. okay, so hold on. I give hold you on. a chance. Like, let you me know? finish. You, you asked me a question. Let me answer the question, okay? Everyone has the right to decide who they want to spend their time talking to. And I don't really care to talk to you. I just don't. I don't remember why now. You're not no, important no, but, enough but that I really... Hold on a base, second. Right? Please let me finish my answer. Then I will let you talk again. I just muted you now. I don't want to talk to you. I don't remember why I blocked you now. I can go back and find the tweet if you want. If you really want to know. But the point is... If you have a question today, I'm happy to answer your question. I'm happy to engage with you on the content that we're discussing right now. Why don't you want to debate me? I'm just not interested in having Twitter debates with random people. Sometimes I'm interested, sometimes I'm not. You in particular, there's a specific reason why I blocked you. I don't remember now what it was. But that doesn't matter because I have the right to say no if I don't want to. Now, if you have an actual topic question, We'll be happy to discuss that with you now. Abdul Gandal, do you want to answer him before I unmute him? Uh, yeah, I mean, just to tell him that he says that we're scared of debates. I mean, that's totally wrong. I've talked to, we both have talked to people way above his pay grade and his qualifications. In fact, I've had a long discussion with a PhD from, I think it was Columbia University, Dr. Hassan Azad in Islamic studies. I've talked to Mufti Abu Layth as well. I've talked to the director of uh, Ask a Muslim in Canada, Omar Abdul Fattah. We actually talked to a very learned but, anonymous Muslim why, as well, named why, Shaheen why, why? Ahmed. Please let him finish and then you can talk. Yeah, so the point is that we, we're not scared of debates. In fact, we love engaging with people. It's just that not every person online is worthy of engaging with, nor everybody should be given a platform because, you know, like sometimes the arguments just are repeated on and on over and over again. Again, I've talked to people way like i said way above you actual phd in islam okay, okay so then, then it would be easy right? okay one second one second so you were asking me why i don't engage with people like you there can, you go can you look at this shit like should i engage with someone like you who does stuff like this give me a goddamn break man <laughs> like I, I i let you on the stream despite knowing that you're the same guy that i blocked and and this is not the only one there's other pathetic tweets from Abdullah you. Samir, listen, yeah. you compared Muhammad listen. with George Floyd. Remember you said, can't breathe? Like, okay. Listen. Seriously, stop being hypocritical. Okay. Bye-bye. Listen, <laughs> I don't want to talk to you because you don't know how to engage, okay? That's simple. If you want, if you have something related to the content that we're talking about, then I'm happy to engage with you. If you're going to bring up, why don't you want to debate me? Then 
who are you? Like, who are you anyways? You're just some random dude. Like, I don't have to talk to you if I don't want to. If you have something to discuss, then I'm happy to discuss. That's that simple. You want to add anything, Gondola? Uh, I mean, like I said, he just came here to vent about he's mad that why we didn't talk to him and we talked to other people instead of him. And that's pretty clear to me. And like you said, like he's he told he said that you weren't a Muslim to begin with. I don't know if he, I think him and his buddies have at times floated the idea that I was a Qadiani, I wasn't a Muslim, true Muslim, Ahmadi, some say I was Shia. Like there have been issues like this, right? So, like I said, it's not that we're scared uh, because we've debated people way above his pay grade, way more qualified than him. We've engaged them in formal and informal, casual. Well, here's your chance. Too. Here's your chance exactly. to debate us. And, and what do you do? Ranting. Why don't you debate me? Why are you learning? Okay. There's 153 people here watching. And instead of actually debating, what do you do? Yeah, you're freaking grandstanding. <laughs> Like, oh my God, the, the level of, like, these people are like, <sighs> seriously, oh my God, so annoying. Right. Okay, uh, Ali, I can't add you to the stream because your uh, microphone or camera is not connected. But yeah, like, one dawah, if you actually have content, like, actual topic to discuss, we can talk to you. I'm happy to talk to you. If you're just going to grandstand... Then no, I'm not interested. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. But add Ali's here now. Hey, Ali, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, I would like to say that uh, I enjoyed your content, and I'm actually Thank a you. recent uh, ex-Muslim. Nice. Uh, Welcome to the fold of ex-Islam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have like two questions, but they're not related to the topic. <clears throat> One was. How do I like separate myself from the morals of this religion? For example, uh, I've been raised as a Muslim, so like when I go to a restaurant or when I go somewhere, I will, I have this urge to ask if it's halal or where did this chicken or meat come from, even though I don't believe in uh, halal or something. It's, it's just ingrained in me. Uh, uh, so how can I stop these? Uh, you could say Islamic morals from like, or how can I separate uh, separate myself from these morals? Um, and the second thing is like, uh, from when I was a child, uh, the concept of hell and uh, torture and all of that uh, just, you know, uh, got the better of me. And sometimes I like think like, um, if I'm wrong, I'm like risking this thing. Um, so how can I um, like, you know, deal with the concept of hell. Uh, I know you've talked about it, but uh, just like more tips. Thank you. You're welcome, man. Thanks for calling in uh, for the questions. So first thing you asked was how to separate yourself from Islamic morality. Again, I understand you because like I grew up for like 20 some years of my life and some years while living this, viewing the world from a specific moral standpoint, moral viewpoint, right? So, um, like, for example, you feeling like, you know, aversion towards pork or non-halal things for a little bit. It's normal because, like I said, there's uh, your brain is used to it. You have habits developed. These are ingrained in you over time is what the whole point of indoctrination is. So to how you'll get rid of these is obviously with the with time and desensitization, like the more time you spend uh, uh, outside the full of Islam and slowly you'll get more used to these things and you'll hang out with people. Again, it's it's going to take time because like you said, it gets ingrained and it becomes habit, right? Uh, secondly, for hell and torture, like it's unfortunate to say, but uh, hell and torture is very, very dark. It can affect people in ways they, they don't even understand. Um, it can the whole idea of using fear and torture to, is, is to coerce you or scare you into obedience, right? Um, and again, you have to keep reminding yourself that, you know, this isn't real. But for me, I remember my grandfather telling me that don't fix, even when I was a Muslim, don't fixate on the descriptions of hell or you will go crazy. And in my continuing research, I have found that Muhammad has a predisposition to very extreme violent uh, pictures or ideas. 
of hell and whatnot, and we will go through their neurological occurrence with uh, other examples of other people suffering from the same illness and then how they view there's a deepening of emotional or an intensifying of emotions that happens. But uh, yeah, man, hell can take a while to get over. At the same time, you have to realize that even though it's a scary concept in its entirety, it's not real at all. It evolved much later, even it didn't exist in Judaism in that sense. The way we see it in Islam is more of like an evolve. It maybe read on the history of hell uh, or read a concept of afterlife that is very different from the Islamic concept, just, just to counteract and give your brain newer ideas to process this in different ways. Uh, that'll be all for me for that question. Uh, yeah, so I'll just add a little bit. Um, you don't have to like get rid of your Islamic morality, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I've had this question from other people as well. Just go with, you know, if you, unless you want a specific, the specific things in Islam that bother you and you want, you don't want to do that anymore. For example, you know, for some people it's eating pork, but you don't have to eat pork. Like it doesn't matter. Like no one's going to force you to do that. So if you, if you have some sort of like, um, you know, you don't like it, that's fine. If you're used to, you know, certain things, if there's certain good things from Islam that you have, keep doing them like you don't have to stop doing them just because it's islamic right and I, I know that's not what you mean but just in case just keep that in mind just go with the flow take your time and um things will change you know it, it just takes time literally like give it time and uh, after some time you'll find that you'll feel comfortable with you know some of the things that you weren't comfortable with maybe you know for example if it's you know, interacting with the opposite sex. You were never used to that. You were always kept away from, you know, talking to women, for example, but you can get comfortable. You can learn how to make friends. You can learn how to make more non-Muslim friends, stuff like that. So yeah, just give it time. Is that, does that, an does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I have a uh, third question if you don't have mm -hmm. a problem. It's okay, about sure. uh, the death and that. Like, I like, now I know certainly or to a, uh, uh, like I believe that I will, there's no afterlife. Like when I die, it's just the end. It's the absolute end. And like, it's kind of depressing. Um, and sometimes like, I think to myself, it's like, you know, uh, some maybe is like ridiculous and bad and all that, but at least kind of gave me some hope um, because uh, the concept of death and coping with death and, like I'm going to end, like I'm not going to go somewhere. It's just the end. This is my only chance at life. So what's your thoughts on uh, the concept of death and the concept of like, basically this is the only chance you have, basically? Mm -hmm. So one of the ways I view it as people, I ask them, think about the billions of years you were not alive and the universe existed without you and there was no issues and it did it bother you so i asked them to think like this and then think about this well it would be the same you will return to the same condition you were before you were born i.e not existing in a sense secondly um I do also find like death as uh, in, a, in a certain way comforting because you also realize that, okay, there is only limited joy and limited suffering. Not everybody has to suffer forever, you know, and that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, for me, for purpose and hope, again, I feel like as time goes on with me from personally, uh, you see the world and life in a much more different, fuller perspective. And I feel like it's more than just having the will to live on. Rather, sometimes it can be beautiful that you have a limited amount of time and you can make the most of it, right? So I don't know. It's, it's, it's a deeper discussion. I mean, uh, there's a good book uh, written on uh, consciousness by Sam Harris's wife, if you want to read it. It's a very thin little book. She talks about it uh, briefly as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can always adopt other like spiritual uh, ideas, like uh, let's say get into meditation that really helps. Um, but yeah, that would be my advice. If you have anything else, let me know. Yeah, I would just say like what you said is so true. And there is a certain beauty. And, you know, in a way, when I stopped believing in the hereafter, 
in a kind of shocking way, I suddenly felt that life is more precious. It's kind of bizarre. Like it's you don't expect you don't expect that conclusion, but in a way, you suddenly realize, oh shit, this sunrise is so fucking beautiful. Because there's only so many more sunrises I'm gonna have. It's not like life is gonna go on forever and ever and hereafter. So you you actually tend to appreciate every moment a lot more. It's just it's just it's all the way you look at things, you know. And um, I think yeah, Abdul Gandil he just nailed it. I don't think there's much to add to it, but um, I might make an unorthodox recommendation, which is try shrooms. You might <laughs> find it to depending on your mental state and if you're okay with that and it's you're not gonna like you know make sure the set and setting is good for you you might find it it resets your brain in a way that makes things more what beautiful. did you say what is that shrooms mushrooms uh psilocybin again we're so, not trying to encourage like drug use and something we're just giving <laughs> perspectives that some people oh, some, re okay. some researchers I, have it's yeah, for depression I, and whatnot yeah you you have to obviously you know, look at your mental state and whether you're prone to uh, any sort of, you know, instability of your mind. But if not, there's a lot of evidence that shows that psilocybin can have a very positive effect on your well-being, especially if you're having depression or anything like that. Um, obviously, there's no medical grade psilocybin you can get in America just yet or Canada or most of the world. In Netherlands, it's legal. So you can actually buy it and try it. But um, I have myself tried it once and it was quite a positive experience. So that's something I can recommend. Um, maybe you can try it one day and you might have, just make sure that you're in a safe place, that your surroundings, you feel comfortable, that you you know what you're doing and you're getting, you know, you're not like, anyways, look into it. That's all I'm gonna say. That's That's one thing you can possibly look into. And for me, it was quite a positive experience. So most people, it's, when they when they do a survey on the experience taking um, shrooms or LSD, I haven't tried LSD, they rate it as one of the most meaningful experiences of their life. It's a very powerful, exp it can be a very, very powerful experience. So it's something you can try, just, uh, just throwing it out there. And uh, thanks for your call. Uh, we have other people waiting, so I have to let you go. Thank you, but, thank uh, you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks the for answers. calling, man. Take care, bye. Hey, Jalal, how's it going? Hello? Hello. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. I'm literally, uh, ten, I'll give me 10 minutes. I'll be right back if that's okay. Sounds okay. good. I'll take someone else. Uh, Foji. Hey. Foji hey. soldier. <laughs> Foji serial. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. X, um, X Foji. Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. um, How's it going? X Foji serial, long time sufferer of, um, this cult called Islam from Pakistan and a uh, long time uh, atheist, probably a uh, uh, teenish kind of thing when when it all kicked in. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, brief, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief and simple. Um, I, I heard something like a week back and it was, it just, you know, it just reaffirmed what I believed all my life. I'm, um, I'm probably double the age of, you know, you guys. Um, um, if there is, if there is an omnipotent, an omnipotent God, all-powerful God, especially in our case from Pakistan, you know, I, th I think Samir is also from Pakistan, right? Like the roots. Oh, you're not. Okay, India probably. Yeah, yes. India. Yeah, because yeah. I, I okay. only probably because I was in. So, my great great my great grandparents immigrated from India to Kenya, from the. Okay. Gujarat. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, now I get, get the lineage, uh, the, the historical background. Okay. Um, so, anyways, so if there is an omnipotent God, all powerful Allah, uh, for that matter, <clears throat> can He create a, a rock that He Himself cannot lift? I see Gondel smiling. He He knows where this is going. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, do you want me to answer or give my thoughts on that question? Yes. So yes. Uh, it's a, it's kind of a logical uh, loophole. Or, so if God is all powerful, he should be able to do everything and anything. But then can he create a, law, a rock 
that he can't lift, which a lot of theists would tell you that it's a the, the question itself or the demand itself is logically inconsistent because then that would violate God's own omnipotence where he could not lift the rock, therefore he isn't all powerful. But then other people say that this whole question demonstrate that all powerful or these maximally great traits just cannot exist in reality because there's what entails from these maximally perfect perfection of these traits, like all powerful, all knowing is they're inherently contradictory and logic illogical in the way they're made where a being with these kind of traits cannot exist in, in, in any logical substantiated way. When this again is like, justice and mercy comes in torture and love comes in they'll always conflict because these traits are in fact an amalgamation of our human experiences which we are projecting onto god right so um it's like if god can create a stone uh that he cannot lift well then that says that he's not omnipotent but then if he can't create the stone that he can't lift then he's again not omnipotent so this is the whole premise of the question right and then the theist would say, oh, well, the whole point is God's omnipotent. Therefore, he can never violate his own omnipotence. But what's fundamental here is you're holding something else uh, more at the core of God. You know, like God is bound by logic almost. But then logic is also his creation. Do you understand what ends up happening? Where we say that God cannot create a rock that he cannot lift because it is illogical, because it will violate his own logic. But then we don't realize that, wait a second, God is the one who created logic in the first place. So these kind of questions, they end up going circle back. But the best thing they demonstrate is that a being with these kind of traits cannot exist. And the problem is that we have this picture of a being like this existing because of our limited perception of our emotions, right? And we don't understand even the subjectivity and, and the cascades of different emotional layering. Like, for example, God loves you. Well, then what is love? You know, like love is in essence where you, you value somebody's contribution to your life or helping you survive in a way, or there's so many different ways. So what kind of love and whatnot? Uh, but yeah, that's like, it's a kind of a similar question where if God knows everything, uh, like he's om omniscient, then what's the point of testing us, right? What's the point of doing anything at all? If he knows everything that's going to happen, if, for example, if God knows everything that's going to happen, then why does he blame Satan for going astray when God already knew that he put it in? In fact, there's hadith where it said that Moses and, uh, what was it, Abraham were arguing or no, Adam were arguing. And Adam says, don't blame me for sinning and eating the fruit or whatever. God had written that in my decree, right? So it creates like a tautology where you're chasing the tail. Uh, that's my few thoughts on the question. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. Um, I always saw it as a silly question because I always considered mm. logic to be not something God created, but logic to be something outside of God's creation, meaning like... But but some theists, again, would say that God is a paradox that you can't understand, just like the Trinity. I kind of like relating it to the Trinity and saying, well, why is the tr Muslims love to say the Trinity is illogical. But then why why is it illogical? Why can't God come down as a man? That's I think mm -hmm. that's a better question. I think mm -hmm. that's a better question. Not can God create a rock you can't lift? Why can't God come down as a man? He mm -hmm. could. Yeah. If he's God, he could come down as a man. You can't say God can't come down as a man. Because it will make him less than God. No, it wouldn't. He can do whatever he wants, right? So mm -hmm. that I think is a better question because then that exposes Muslims to thinking about whether, you know, they're just outright, you know, oh, why does it have to be one God and not multiple? That doesn't have to be one God. It doesn't <laughs> have to be necessarily. We're, we're just making up words and things here. So yeah, that's all I have. I don't have much to say on this, to be honest. Uh, thank you for your call, Foji. Uh, we'll, uh, we do have, have other... anything? I I have a yeah. follow up if if you yeah okay uh, if you can make it quick right. yeah yeah oh, yeah same same thing I, I think Gondul uh, was going in the right direction but he, he kind of veered off in a different tangent at the end <laughs> uh, what what so can I for for argument's sake can I say that that my thought process is better than uh, than Allah's process because nowhere Allah says you know that you know fourteen hundred or twelve hundred years down the road. Um, some some 
so moron would would wake up one day and say you know and come up with this statement that is the, if there is an omnipotent god um, all, uh, allah and he can create can he create a rock that he can he himself cannot live he would have been able to see in the future he would have been able to say somewhere in, in the in the magical book of quran that you know here here's the answer and and i don't find that anywhere what i'm trying to say is that can i quantify this to say that my thought process is better than allah's thought process your mic i I don't think that, to be honest, these are the best arguments against Islam or God in general. Because, so what you just said about you know smarter than God kind of idea, it, it is kind of it does kind of make sense what you're saying, because a lot of the theology of Islam and Christianity came up after you know over the hundreds and hundreds of years after Islam. You have you know Ghazali and these people who responded to philosophy, and you you know they basically built on the theology and the aqida that was very primitive. Because you have when you you know when you have certain very basic aqida that that just very illogical. You know, for example, God coming down to lowest heaven if you take it literally, it leads to all sorts of irrational um, you know contradictions. For example, if God's coming down. And shouldn't he always be down because this, you know, the sun, the you know, night, it's always night somewhere in the world. So the hadith that says he comes down, well, he can't really come down, he has to be down. So then you had the the you 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 had uh, a shari thought that said you can't take this literally. This is this is just you know, God's coming down with his you know, he's not actually coming down, God doesn't move, he doesn't have a body, he's not located in time and space. So a lot of this theology was built up over the years after Islam, you know, after Islam's prophet just made dumb statements, in my opinion. So um, I guess you could say in, in a different way, yeah, that we, we are solving the holes in the religion, like human beings are, are patching the holes everywhere they find them but i don't think it's it's really fair to say that you know i had this specific question and god didn't answer my specific question so therefore islam is false you know what i mean i think that's kind of silly to say that and i don't think that's a good argument but if you say it a different way like the other problems in the theology and we humans had to fix them then I, yeah i would agree with you okay good stuff uh carry on guys uh talk later Thank you Thank so much, both of you. Thanks Thank for you. calling in, man. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Jalal, hey. Hey, Jalal. Hello. Hello, what's up, man? Hi, Jalal. Hi guys. How are you doing? You okay? Good, good. <laughs> okay, uh, I just had one quick question, if that's okay, if you could answer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it was a while back I tried contacting Samir on Twitter, but I believe I couldn't get through to him for some reason. So, I just thought I'd ask on this uh, live. Now, from what I've seen, a lot of the ex-Muslims that do leave end up leaving based off of their personal and their cultural uh, experiences. But mm -hmm. I have seen a minority that do leave based off, you know, if they do find scientific errors or if they do find, uh, how do I say it? If they do find things that don't make sense within the theology of Islam, I do respect that if you leave on that basis. But... Essentially, the question I did ha have for you guys is, I'm assuming you're both atheists, if I'm right. Yeah. Uh, are you Muslim? I am, yeah. I, I am Muslim. I studied engineering, okay. but one thing that did despite my attention was that for the first time in my life, I did come across an ex-Muslim in person, and I did have an interesting discussion, And because I've never ever seen people that just leave Islam and openly talk about it. Usually, from what I have seen, a lot of Muslims that do leave, they just... They just leave and they don't really make much of a, uh, you know, too much of a fuss about it. But yeah. one thing I did have uh, a question is with regards to the finely tuned aspects of the universe, like because I've studied engineering, I believe that only if you have a thorough understanding of these things can you actually appreciate the, the miracle in them. For example, the idea that gravity, if it was 0.00x stronger, life would not exist because from an ev evolutionary point of view, nothing would exist because everything would collapse on itself. And if it was 0 0.00 weaker, the perfect chemical reactions wouldn't occur for evolution to occur. Now, just this, this the other things that I've read, for example, they say that the universe, the chances of the universe being created is something like if you, if you roll the dice 60 million times and it landed on six repeatedly. And I'd say to you guys, what is your 
take on the finely tuned aspects of the universe from an athe I'm not too sure what your particular belief is. I know you guys are atheists, you said, but do you believe in Darwinism, uh, Darwinism or other types of evolution? I'm not too sure, but the question I do have is, do you guys just throw away these finely tuned aspects of the universe? Because for me, it's easier to comprehend if I attribute this idea to God or something that is more powerful. I can see you on the okay. laughing. I say. I, yeah. I just want to ask one question. Uh, is okay. God is God more complex than the universe? You see, I, I would say that that depends because our understanding of the universe and physics that has been shaped by what we know and the laws of physics are to our understanding. But I would say that because God, God of my understanding is out of the uh, physical capabilities of what we can understand and he is out of the laws of physics if you if you try and get what i'm trying to say i understand but what i'm trying to ask is is god okay let's say allahu akbar is god okay. greater and greater than the universe yes i would say yes, yes. is god with his traits like he can hear and listen and know everything is he the most maximally, let's say, the most complex being out there to you? Yes, definitely. How can the most complex being and the most complex thing in the universe exist without an explanation, but the universe, which is less complex than God, exists without? With, you understand what I'm trying to say? I can get what you say. I do see what you're saying, but, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the idea of the finely tuned aspect, okay, yeah. let's just say for the sake of understanding God, God doesn't exist, just for the sake of understanding. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is, how do you guys personally uh, take on this idea of the finely tuned aspects of the universe? They say that if you were to roll a dice 60 million times and it landed on six, that's the same chances of everything that's occurred to this day, mm -hmm. how that would have occurred. Now, to me, that, that just sounds so incredible. Or if, if gravity was 0.00x stronger or weaker, yeah. the chemical reactions wouldn't have occurred for evolution mm -hmm. to occur or yeah, so yeah. many other things that i've just read and to me atheism it, it just that idea of atheism i can understand some aspects of it but but just that idea do, do you guys just throw out the finely tuned aspects or what do you so say? i'm gonna i'm trying to tackle it in a way where i'm asking you does complexity okay. necessitate intelligence i'd say it, it depends Okay, so what I'm trying to sh what I'm trying to show you is you are arguing that a being that is way more complex than the universe exists without a cause, but the universe yes. can't exist with a cause that is not as complex as God, right? So what I'm trying to get to here is, and then you bring up the idea of eternity. Think about eternity like uh, rolling a dice, but eternity necessitates this all. Uh, combinations, no matter how least probable they are, will eventually come to pass. So if okay. our universe existing, let's say, uh, is one into the whatever power, if time is eternal, eternity necessitates that anything and every combination with if time passes that way will come to pass, right? Uh, that's one thing I see that eternity can then also cause you to think that, okay, every possible, possible configuration of matter no matter how long it will take or no matter how little the chance it will have because if eternity exists, it will happen. There's one thing like that. Secondly, the other thing I find is uh, fine tuning the argument itself. It looks, it cherry picks on the things that appear designed to us, but negates things that don't appear as designed to us, right? Uh, uh, Rationality Rules is a very good video on it as well. And he goes in the same uh, argument, if you, the watchmaker analogy, right? Where if you're walking uh, in a forest and you pick up a rock, mm -hmm. and if you find a watch, which one of you are you going to think is designed versus not designed? Of course, right? the watch. Yeah. The watch, right? But then with, you have to understand that the rock itself is also part of the same universe. It's just that it doesn't appear to them, but you're cherry picking on just the design things and leaving out the things that don't appear to you as design. And when you actually think about it, your perception of design then comes out from how things emerge around you and your reality. So there's a lot of uh, 
things. Then also another thing is life existing is a standard or not. Like, well, okay, if life didn't exist, if it has a billion and one chance, yeah, life wouldn't exist. The universe would still exist like it existed before life existed on Earth, right? And is life existing on Earth any, is it necessary to give meaning to the universe? Or would it cause any changes if, if, for example, Earth didn't exist, but the universe still exists? Right, so we somehow then realize that we're attaching irrelevant importance to certain aspects because we're viewing it from a lens of of design. Uh, again, like one could go on to more. I already talked about eternity and chance, probabilities. We talked about the complexity. Um, I think you mentioned that the first was ex-Muslims leave due to uh, personal reasons. Was it was one yeah. of those things? Yeah. Uh, no, no, that wasn't really a point. I was just trying okay. to uh, give them the quick answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'll yeah. give you another example to quickly summarize my thoughts. The Think about God having the ability to feel, love, hear your voice when you pray to him. Okay. And whatnot, right? So... <clears throat> What ends up happening is God uh, can hear you, can talk to you. Sorry, just got to get this point back. Mm -hmm. I can also How add do you... something when you're done. Just yeah, okay, wanna... you can add something. I just got to reformulate okay. this one. So, um, yeah, the whole thing about emotional reasons, I, I think we've talked about that a bit. want to quickly mm -hmm. address that. I think everyone does things for emotional reasons, whether it's Muslims or ex-Muslims. The, the fact is we should try not to make, we should try to be as rational as possible while also listening to what our emotions are telling us. Our emotions are there for a reason. And sometimes our emotions will actually misguide us and sometimes they will guide us in the right way. Sometimes people are not good at explaining themselves and it may come across as an emotional reason, but really inside that emotional reason, there is some logic there. The question is whether that logic is true or false. Um, someone can, for example, leave Christianity for emotional reasons because they feel, you know, even they can they can leave Christianity and become Muslim because they want to marry a Muslim man. And then they find, for example, after leaving, you know, Christianity that oh, Islam is true and they start to, you know, connect to it or whatever. That doesn't mean that the reason they did it it might be wrong, but the question is what are the real reasons for believing or not believing in a religion, not why they did it. So of course you'll find all sorts of different people out there and most people don't talk about leaving Islam because, well, there's, there's, there's consequences. You can become canceled. Like many people that I know that want to be public ex-Muslims, even people that are budding public ex-Muslim figures, for example, Aladdin and Aisha Muhammad, look at, look at, the, look at the backlash Aisha Muhammad got, infidel noodle. She's been getting there's a there's a campaign to expose her to get her uh, like like, this, this, like you, you do this at your own risk. If you're a white man like Sam Harris and you try to um, you're a white man and you try to talk about Islam, it's even worse. If you're a brown man, okay, you might get away with it. But if you're a white man, it's even worse. You're just gonna be like absolutely um you know canceled like completely canceled like it's gross and racist to talk about islam like as uh, you know as, as you remember from that little clip with sam is but anyways that's not your main question i just wanted to quickly address that that's your fine. main question was about fine tuning and i just want to share my screen for one second i first of all i would recommend you to check out um sam uh, uh matt dillahunty the atheist experience they they tackle these questions really well um, but I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, this is a wonderful book that I let I read after leaving Islam, which is called Atheism Explained from Folly to Philosophy by David Ramsey Steele. He has a whole chapter on um, on this whole fine tuning argument, and it's it's beautifully explained. Did someone set the dial? And he goes through point by point by point the anthropic coincidences. We don't know that a universe is improbable. Like when we say the chance. Mm -hmm. the, the, the reality is the chance might have been a hundred percent. You don't, you can't say the chance is point zero, 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 zero. We don't know. We don't, we, we don't have the, the conditions where we can say that the, that it has to be exactly this. And, and there may be many universes. Mm -hmm. There may be every single possible universe that can exist might exist. And if that's the case, then we can't say that it's like it's unlikely because well there's there's a universe with every condition right we don't know that 
right? There may be natural selection of universes. This is a beautiful point that to the quantum foam, we know that universes can pop in and out of existence. It could be that the universes with the right conditions are naturally selected to survive and they continue existing because like you said if the weak uh nuclear well you didn't say but if the weak nuclear force was a little bit more or the strong nuclear force was a little bit more the universe would have collapsed well there you go the ones that collapsed they probably did collapse if yeah. there were multiple universes. we don't know like <laughs> this question beg is basically begging the question we can't like when theists try to say the the universe is improbable and it's you know perfectly coincides, it, it's in a way the puddle issue. You know, there's a hole in the ground and the puddle and it rains. The puddle says, "Look, this hole was made for me," but actually, no, the the hole wasn't made for the puddle. The puddle exists because of the hole. You know what I'm saying? The same way that we we could say, "Wow, this 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 planet is just right in the perfect position." Think, think of it. I get you. Every planet is a roll of a dice and mm -hmm. it might have life or not on it. So when we think about it that way, you have, let's say, billions and billions and billions of failed attempts at life, but you have one real one. Now, that's not a sign of fine tuning. For example, some theists say that, you know, life universe is fine tuned for life. No, it looks more fine tuned to create black holes and dead planets than lively planets, right? So against what's important is your your point of reference where why do you perceive human life to be fundamental if the earth didn't exist the universe would keep existing it did and it does you know now a second another thing i wanted to come back to is this is a question i want to ask you does god have a mind does god have a mind um i would say he has consciousness but a mind in in what terms of what in what aspects are you asking when he has a mind so you said God is conscious, but what predicates, what what is necessary for consciousness to exist? I'm not sure. I'm going to ask you, you rephrase the question. Can software run without hardware? No, but I. I <laughs> it's a good question because God is basically a disembodied mind that's making decisions. I, I'm talking about theism, especially Islam. God is going into his creation. He's involving himself he's making decisions he's he's um basically revealing things to human he is a mind what what else would you describe that we're not talking about hinduism god is atman god is this force we're talking about islam where god is like a sky daddy like would you not agree that god is a mind and what else would god you can't just if god isn't a mind then how is he doing how is he interacting with human beings how is he you know do you, do you understand what we're saying? No, I understand what you're saying, but I would say that's that's to our to our definition of what a mind is. Yeah, but then that's again you're also making taking a huge leap of faith where you don't have <laughs> any evidence of any minds existing without hardware, but yeah. you're trying to think that God's mind exists without our hardware, right? You I know, I so. I think you know, Jalal, I think that believing in God is okay, and it, mm -hmm. it is let's say possible depending on what you mean by God. If you're telling me God is a power or force that pervades the universe without consciousness, then I might even agree with you that that's mm -hmm. God. But if you're saying God is a man in the sky, I know we, I know Muslims don't say man in the sky, but he is like a man in the sky. The Islamic God is a man that revealed, and someone mentioned this in the comments, that you know he, he decided to reveal that you can marry your adopted son's ex-wife. Like When you get into the details, it all falls apart. But if you're just talking about God in general, then you know god this this originator of the universe well i can i can possibly believe that that there's a possibility that there's a god but when you talk about a god that goes and involves himself in the matter of humans and created angels and jinns and talk to humans in a cave then it starts to all fall apart and really does so mm -hmm. that's why i tend to really go back to the details of religion rather than focusing on whether god uh, god existed or god didn't exist the most he, so uh, at this said the most complex being allowed muhammad to marry his adopted son's ex-wife this is very complex man it's true like when you look at the like the details it it becomes a joke this is god like this is the creator of like the serious like the star binary stars of the cell the living you you believe that this same god is revealing to muhammad that he can marry his adopted son's ex-wife because that's important for humanity it doesn't make sense it's it, you're talking about two different beings here 
the, the originator of the Quran, the originator of the universe and the Quran cannot be the same person. And but but I do think there is good philosophical responses. If you just just look at atheist channels like Matt Dillahunty, mm -hmm. he totally destroys anyone that calls it and brings up this point. But or just check out the book. Um, but I you if you have anything else we can talk about, feel free. But otherwise we're gonna get back to we have like I think only fifteen minutes left now. Um, so I did have one quick uh, final uh, question, if, if you don't mind. Yeah. I was just gonna ask. So essentially, I did talk tell you about how. I spoke to one ex-Muslim on my engineering course, and mm -hmm. one thing that he did say to me is that one thing he can't grasp his mind around is the the concept of Islamic uh, miracles. And he's talking about how different religions have different miracles in terms of their mathematical miracles. And he was talking about he was, he was saying to me, he, I, I believe the experience, the example he gave me is is to do with a greater conspiracy of Illuminati or something. He's saying that. The prophet huh? had some. I don't know if the prophet had must have had some sort of connection with the Illuminati to know X, Y, Z. And I know that a lot of I, Illuminati. I did, Illuminati I is know, the thing, though. <laughs> I don't know. This is what he was he was talking about. But he was talking about different conspiracy theories and whatnot. But from the research that I did do, I guess you could say that a lot of the uh, quote unquote things that were predestined to happen that he said were going to happen were quite vague. I guess you could say, but. There are some things like, for example, the mathematical miracles that I did see in the Bible as well and the Hebrew text uh, and uh, as well as the uh, the Hindu scriptures. When I looked into those as well, when I was Googling it, a lot of them do have mirac mathematical miracles that I just can't grasp my head around. I know you're laughing right now, but I mean, I mean, do you guys have an explanation for is, that? Is it the one where the miracle of the number 19, the Satasha, or like the word Yom being used 365? Is it of that nature? No, 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 no. It's, it's. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was one for uh, something to do with uh, C okay. and lambda. So, and yeah, okay, that's the same thing. Yeah, so, same type. Uh, what yeah. I, what I would recommend is, well, first of all, if this miracle is appearing in other books, then obviously it's not that miraculous. The Hindu you, God can't be the same as Muslim and both be right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the point I was trying to make. Look into medical claims, it, you have to look into the details and you have to ask yourself, am I begging the question? Is it can you find the same miracle in Shakespeare? And I have so I tell your ex-Muslim friend to check out Abdullahsamir.com, mathematical miracles. I have an article on it where I talk about like in Shakespeare, you can find like examples like that too, where love and hate appear the same amount of times. It's there are going to be coincidences like this all over the place. And if the Bible is corrupted, why would the Bible have the same miracles? Like that doesn't even make sense. I was just making a point uh, for in favor of, I guess, the idea of theism. Yeah, but then you have to admit the Bible's not corrupted then, because it has mathematical miracles. It has a checksum, right, so to speak. I, I guess maybe, maybe, maybe not. God, then, or maybe Krishna is God because they have miracles too. So you, I think you debunked yourself right there. I, I, I was going to say that I'm I, I'm in favor. Everything I'm saying is in favor of Islam. I would just say that it's in favor of theism and and how the since I've met this ex-Muslim on my course, it has I wouldn't oh, say yeah. doubts, but it, it's led me to Moby Dick. question certain things. <laughs> okay, here, here here's one from uh, Moby Dick. <laughs> so Moby Dick, we know he wasn't writing a, a book from god right but someone did research to find or was it me i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that uh found all these coincidences in the book scroll down uh for example pray and slain grave and rest same amount of times faith and blood peace mm -hmm. and marriage. so this shows you that being married is peaceful world <laughs> and earth the same amount of time <laughs> like you can find these coincidences everywhere and the more you look into a book the more of these things you're going to find right I mean, that's, it's just, and, and then here's another problem. The Quran is revealed in multiple dialects. So, and then the other problem with Arabic is, yeah, here you go. He's highlighting it. The word, the word yom can be written as al-yom or ayam or yomain. There's multiple ways. So a lot of these miracles yes, are, cherry is, becomes, is what you say. The inconsistency, count, the counting the, the ones they want to, but not the ones they don't want to in order to make it add up to the number they want. I get you. Yeah. Um, how to let's... Yeah. Basically, Anything else would you like to add? Um, I've looked into the numerology miracles myself. Like when I was, uh, so my own story was that I gave up uh, my faith in hadith before the Quran because I was like, the Quran is from the God, you know, like how is these miracles and stuff, and I hung on to the book. But then after I looked into it as well, and 
I had the, there was this doctor who did this research, this other 19 appointed over it, and he was trying to make the Quran, everything. Rashid Khalifa. Rashid yeah. Khalifa. Yeah. yeah, make factorials of 19, everything. But then we found out, no, that wasn't right. Because one, one of the funny things I'll mention to you right now uh, about Numan Ali Khan. So, the Quran worst numberings in the Warsh Quran, the Duri, the Susi Quran, the Hafsan Asim, they're different. Okay. So you probably come across Numan Ali Khan quite a few times, right? On YouTube, yeah. 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 And you probably might have heard this. I'll give you one generic example. As he says in Surah Baqarah, Allah says, ummatan wasata, that we'll make you the middle nation. And then Numan Ali Khan says that, funny enough, Surah Baqarah has 286 verses and Wajalnakum ummatan wasata occurs in 143 words, which is right in the middle. Therefore, it's a miracle. How did he know? When you actually look it up, the verse numbering in the different revayas of the Quran, the seven other readings, is different, right? So that wording doesn't add up. The verse divisions don't add up. In is fact, the Bismillah part of the Quran or not? That's debated as well, the Bismillah. Exactly. Now, and 143 is an even number. It's not the middle. The middle <laughs> have is 287, <laughs> right? In, in the verse, is 27 verses. Yeah, so 204 okay. doesn't work out the miracle. Then a lot of the I'm times... Saying, 286 is an even number. There is no middle. Mm -hmm. there's, two middles. there's two middle numbers, right? Because it has to be odd to be for there to be middle. So, for example, the middle number of, from 1 to 3 is 2. There's no middle number from 1 to 4. There is yeah, no middle. Yeah, yeah. Right? It'll be like 2 and a half or 3 and a half, exactly. something like that, yeah. Between the two, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I find that like the, the versions of the Quran actually refute a lot of these numerical claims because, for and the thing is, you'll be shocked to know that you can't even make claims about word counts anymore because guess what? Different readings of the Quran have different words in them. Literally numbers of letters are different. There's a whole hua missing in one of them. So if you're trying to apply the miracle of 19, oh, this verse multiplies and the word bibaka, well, in another reading, no, it doesn't. So you're kind of cherry picking one reading from the other to kind of make it work. I get you. Yeah. You know what I mean? I get you. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's great. Thanks a lot, guys. No, no problem. Yeah. Man. It was nice All having right. this discussion. All right. It was Thank super you. cool. We talked yeah. about a few things. Thank you yeah, so really, much. I really appreciate your call, man. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See, we enjoy discussions like this instead of somebody coming up like, why don't you debate? Me? I would appreciate exactly what Jalal did. That was amazing. All right. Uh, hey, Lisa, how's it going? Hello. Hey, what's up? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 yeah so I'm, I'm from India, actually. So I'm an agnostic. Um, so I've been researching about religion. So um, I found that people have problems with religious teachings more than the concept of God. So what is your take on it? Like, are you against the concept of God or like we should be against the religion itself? Like religion... Mm -hmm. I, I think I just answered that. I said I don't yeah. really care if people believe in God. Yeah. I don't even care if people are Muslim or non-Muslim. What I care about is how they treat others. How the religion influences the world that we live in. That's the important thing. If the religion is going to you know, teach that women are inferior, they should get half the inheritance, that you can beat your wife, that you can do, then that's the problem. If you just want to believe in some random... I mean, that's your business, right? You know what I mean? Um, yeah, so... Uh, Abdul Gandal, you said you got to step off a second. I can keep, I can take questions. Oh, while I already did. Uh, that was, oh, okay, okay, that's okay, earlier, okay. yeah. Okay, so okay. Uh, the question I replied was, firstly, the idea of uh, trying to like merge God with religion is false. Like the idea of a God or a being existing, creating the universe doesn't necessarily mean he has to send us a book and he has to give us these minute laws and whatnot. To him, we could be as useless as ants, you know, like... How, how do we view insects? So what's their purpose in life? We, we as humans deem every other life form to be kind of whatever, useless, right? So to us, a God could view us like that too from a deistic okay. perspective. So okay. God can exist without uh, meddling in or sending us books or talking to us. And just He created the universe and the universe runs on its laws or whatever he's done. He doesn't really intervene, right? Yeah, like, cool. uh, yeah. these are... Yeah, so... so uh, yeah, so I, I want to add uh, Indian philosophy into it. It's called Vedanta. So I have problem with it. So b before get, getting into that, I, I just want to ask you, like, for me to accept God, it's not a problem. But when it comes to the problem of evil, it becomes a big problem. And if, if there is a God, then his duty is to protect the people, right? 
so if if he can't do that properly then he is not fit to be called as a god but then again a question rises does god really need to respond immediately to all the people like does he have any obligation like if he wants he can if he doesn't he does if he doesn't want to then he doesn't want to so i, I think it's I, like what gondol said like we don't even know if there is if there is a god whether he even knows we exist whether he even cares mm-hmm. i think i'm much more um you know likely to believe in a god that doesn't yes. even know that we exist meaning that we are just a side effect like we just evolved out of something in some corner of the universe if there is a god maybe god's like like a jellyfish like a dis- not something with a consciousness like jellyfish are an interesting interesting creatures jellyfish exist without a mind they have no brain mm-hmm. Yet the floating along doing the shit you know <laughs> kind of like a plant or like a giant tree So if this but, but they have stimulus right but they have stimulus wired inside them right like yeah, they respond they empathy, around they have empathy or any sort of you know they don't care about any other mm. creature uh we humans i think we project our ideas onto god you know we want god to be another big a big daddy that takes care of us and protects us and helps us we pray to him this is um i think that's we're just projecting onto god what we want mm. god to be but if there is a god i don't think he he's any of that but is even a key so so the the, the thing is uh, uh, for atheists like i am an agnostic so for atheists the biggest challenge is explaining the origin like just sitting down and just uh, meditating in silence like what happened in the beginning so it it doesn't it, it doesn't seem logical that somehow out of vacuum something just erupted and matter came into existence right we are here like if you touch your own self like on, on the hand you can you can feel your skin so it's all real so but if you go back to like the start of the universe like there there should be something right which created everything and what yeah. created that thing so it's a cycle so there, there there must be something we can't just say okay there there's a big bang and that everything came into existence yes 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 so i'll just take you up on that as a as a point of logic so have you heard about four causes of aristotle no Okay so there is the material cause the final cause the efficient cause and the formal cause I'll actually put up a picture so that'll help with the explanation let me just share my screen Okay can you see that there the four causes Mm, no I, I i can't see okay so just to simplify it if you need to make something right if the first thing was you need for example you're building a table you need to make the table out of something the first thing would be the wood which is the table right the efficient cause would be the force that pushes it into existence which would be you making the table the formal mm. cause would be form function or essence of a thing it is what it does after it's being made and the final is what the thing exists for the sake of the ultimate purpose of the object as in the table exists right yeah uh when you look at it the material cause is missing in god's hypothesis too think about this god exists but where did the matter come from for creating the universe hmm so when you think about this all you're doing is theists don't know they also believe in creation ex nihilo in fact they believe in creation ex nihilo more than atheists i don't believe in it i t- maybe maybe not i'm agnostic about the origins of the universe yeah i'm a uh, i think ex materia makes a lot of sense because if you look at the, what the big bang is it's all of matter already existing and then exploding and expanding the so, material is already there for the big bang where did it come from we don't know maybe it's eternal maybe it's cyclical and i think in i know i think you coming from a hindu background as you said this yes, yes. cyclical universe yeah, yeah in, in hindu philosophy as well which makes a lot more sense than oh big day of judgment creation and god's going to flatten the earth and make the mountains flat and the earth the sun and the moon are going to collapse and everyone's going to be naked and uncircumcised and the sun's going to none of that makes sense it's all bullshit mm-hmm. fairy tales but like okay cyclical universe maybe it's true right maybe it's always been ex nihilo makes no you know doesn't really make sense because we're saying everything had to think about it uh, from from a theistic perspective they still don't have the four causes they still don't have the material cause they use god to then special plead or say god magic material cause okay there you go god created matter out of nowhere in essence they're also arguing just nowhere they just add the god magic. thing and that's the magic basically yeah. like a buzzword at that point 
I mean, the same idea, which if God always existed, we could just say the universe always existed. Why do you need to add a God there? You know what I mean? I mean, even if it's a cyclical thing, there should be a starting point for the cycle to happen, right? Like, in the, well, nothing is perfect. The motion machine cannot exist. Sure. Right? Okay. Start. The idea, one of the things I find is when we talk about these things, our nomenclature, our language is embedded in the perspective of time. Mm -hmm. If there is no time, there is no start and there is no beginning. You understand? Okay. If yeah, there is eternity, yeah. then anything and everything that, for example, take, let's say, a dice, right? The dice has whatever X amount of sides, but let's say you rolling the number 10 is mm -hmm. one in a million. Okay, but because there is no time, regardless, and if there's fluctuation, it will eventually end up happening, no matter what. Yeah. Okay. So every single, every single, yeah, even if there's a million sided die, every single side of that die will always be a hundred percent chance of hitting it. It's not one in a million; it's hundred percent because it's going on forever and ever and ever, right? Yeah, okay. that's true. So uh, if you have like five minutes of time, I can explain the Indian philosophy in like two, three minutes. Like One, one more thing. If, if you're saying that um, God, if you're saying that it has to be a beginning, yeah. then ask, well, what's the beginning of God? Why is it okay for God to always exist? Uh, I mean, they define God as something like non-material. So maybe that's, yeah. that's easy to explain more than material things, you know. Like Big Bang is material, so it's very hard to explain where the material comes from. But God being spiritual, it, it's I think it's it's very easy like to explain his origins, you know, like his eternal, like no matter is involved in it. I, I think whether material or not material, either way, we have a challenge as human beings that there's going to be some questions we can never answer. For example, like why we're here, why we exist, why anything exists. I mean, that's something we've always puzzled on. Mm -hmm. And we're the only creatures out of all of the animals that actually are able to ask ourselves, why do we exist? Why is there a universe? Frankly speaking, I don't think there's any answer for that. I don't think we'll ever be able to answer why there's a universe unless we somehow, you know, like the Truman Show, we, de we detect a sign in the cloud that there's a programmer that programmed us inside exactly. some, like, you know, we're, we're in some simulation or something but, like that. But I'm going to connect this with suffering. You see, when, when people get depressed and they're suffering or they had a huge bad luck, they, they'll think about the universe and why it's happening and ultimately they will find refuge in God. So that 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 refuge, atheism cannot provide it. So you know, but it's like, a refuge because your God, you you're getting refuge and is not actually doing anything for you. So as your child is dying of cancer and you pray to God, you're still you got, your child is still dying of cancer. Like he's not going to come back. Yet you think you're getting something out of it, but you're not. Instead of actually investing energy and in improving the world and maybe doing cancer research. You pray to God and you expecting you're going to meet your child again and so you don't even take any action. Maybe you do take action, maybe you don't. But the, the fact is, I think the idea of God poisons, you know, the belief of uh, actually the fact that this world that we have is the only world and the only short life that we have. But in terms of like explaining Hindu philosophy, I'm going to have to pass on that because we do okay. have two people waiting. Sure, sure, sure. No problem. And uh, I just to show one uh, thing here, just talking about predestination. If you can see that there's uh, in the second one here, you see that Adam and Moses were arguing. Moses said to Adam, you're Adam whose mistake expelled you from paradise. Adam said to him, you are Moses whom Allah selected and spoke directly. Yet you blame me for a thing which had already been written in my fate before my creation. Mm. So Allah had purposefully made this whole plan out that Adam is going to eat from the fruit and whatnot. So it, it, they're arguing and they, the prophets themselves are like, this makes no sense from a theological perspective of free will. It's a big, big problem now. Why is Allah making Adam ask forgiveness from him then? That's the whole thing, the whole point. If, like like, like he knows all the... Yeah, he knows all the options and he knows what, what the man chooses and he knows what will be the consequences. So it's not really a free will, you know, it's, it's like yeah. we plan yeah. this thing. Like Can I? explicit uh, argument between Moses and uh, Adam brings it forth where Moses literally says, uh, you blame me for a thing which had already been written in my fate before my creation. I, Adam is telling Moses that. So the whole original sin thing, it was orchestrated by Allah, right? 
So it makes, from a theological perspective, no sense. Okay. Uh, I just want to add one more thing, which is, um, I forgot my point now. I saw some silly comment. And, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Okay, never mind. Okay. All right, thanks for your call. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, bye. Oh, yeah, I remember what I was going to say. Okay, uh, but you can go. That's fine. Uh, what I wanted to say was, is a lot of people, a lot of people misunderstand. I should have kept him on. Anyways, a lot of people misunderstand what it means to be agnostic and atheist. Most agnostics are also atheists. Agnostic doesn't mean that you are like a half atheist or something or like a baby atheist. Agnosticism and atheism ha talk about two different things. Gnosticism is whether you know. Theism is whether you, you believe. So for a theist is someone who believes in God. Atheist is someone who doesn't believe in God. Agnostic is someone that who knows or doesn't know. So most agnostics are atheists, agnostic atheists. There are also agnostic theists. Like maybe my parents would be considered agnostic theists. They believe in God. But they're also, you know, skeptical, the agnostic, the the questioning. Most agnostics tend to be atheists. So just just wanted to clarify that it's not like a it's not a spectrum. It's more like a it's there's two levels of of you can be agnostic theist, agnostic atheist. You know what I mean? You can be agnostic atheist, gnostic. You can't really be a gnostic atheist because you can't really know there's no God because it's you're knowing something that's that you're like, that's not true. So that's not likely to be the case, but usually you would say agnostic and atheist are yeah. both attributes. So I'm agnostic atheist. I wouldn't be just agnostic. It's not just agnostic or just atheist. Just want to clarify. That. Anyways, thanks for your call. Uh, um, okay. Gone. Uh, Abdullah, we, yeah, we gotta, we gotta get finishing up. So just quickly, uh, Asif. Hello. I'm going to talk here. Uh, Hi. Okay. I think you have the stream. I'm just gonna mute you. I think you have the stream playing in the background. Uh, you need to join the. Hello, pick progress. Hello. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. How's it going? Yeah. Uh, I've been watching Abdullah Samir for some time now. Uh, mm -hmm. I would call myself a recent atheist, but um, I'm still like teetering over the line. Oh, okay. Um, I don't really want to let go of this now. Mm-hmm. But like obvi the obvious things, uh, they don't really make sense, and they're not really um, like very inviting. The child molestation and the slavery part and everything in between. Um, uh, one thing I would like to say that uh, have you guys ever uh, heard about the guy Daniel Hakikachu? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, how how come have how come have you debated that guy? Like uh, he, I saw one of his debates with the uh, uh, red one, and he like completely destroyed him. In my opinion, I'm not saying that uh, red that red one was uh, presenting weak. I mean, he was presenting weak arguments, but he was also very anxious and not very yeah convincing. Yeah, okay, some people are that, not I think that's a problem. Some people, you know, sometimes are not either not prepared or not really understanding what they need to research before doing it. I, I know Ridwan, I don't think did that well in that case, in that particular debate. Uh, maybe he wasn't expecting the, you know, like like Pikachu, uh, I mean, uh, Hakikachu had some specific <laughs> like references which he brought up in the stream. And because he's bringing it up for the first time, you know, Apostate Prophet didn't know about these specific studies or whatever, and he wasn't expecting to be bringing up studies and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe one day we'll we'll debate him, one of us or either of us. I haven't really considered it. Um, it would be interesting, I guess, at some point. I um, debate is not really my thing. I'll, I don't. Know. I'll explain my strategy if I were to debate him. So, firstly, the thing is like he comes from a Shia background, became Sunni, and he's very orthodox, as in very strict and very unapologetic with his views. So, yeah, that's that, that's the thing I was. Really I would just open. With. I would. I wouldn't even say a word. I would just open the books, the classical books of fiqh, and just be like, "This guy says kill ex Muslims, wherever you know all of these things, like the unsheathed sword, Al Salim al Masul, Al Shatim al Rasul, or Reliance of the Traveler." Or as Shifa by Qadi Ayad, and I confront them in the face with these verdicts, and he has nowhere to go. He has to either acknowledge them that he believes in them, or he can diss on all of his classical scholarship. That's the problem. I feel like we need to do is instead of we do half of the problems, we don't even need to debate these people. We just need to show them their own books, 
and then have him explain it to us. And yeah, honestly, the, that will get the half thing about that guy is that he can come up with an explanation for everything. And it's the thing of, uh, like I am not um, like in my own mind very um, uh, very skilled enough to come up with counterpoints in my own head. So I the only choice I have left is just to agree with him. What specific and, points does he did do, do, did he mention like that you um, agree? like uh, 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 let's just take for example the um the war prisoners when you kill uh, soldiers on the other side you can take their women as property right mm -hmm. so he um can justify that that in those times uh, the most uh, the tribe who had the most people they would win and it it sounds very um, dystopian um, um sounds very wet so it's a little bit hard to hear you yeah, yeah, people. It, 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 you. it doesn't sound very good, but at the same time, it kind of makes sense that. Yeah. I mean, the the point is that he was the prophet, and he should have known better. Yeah, but he did. Well, well, and the, the, uh, the have... whole game here is moral relativism, and this okay. is very important for Muslims to understand. And I don't know why he could you either doesn't explain this to the people or he doesn't catch it on, is when Muslims claim. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ That in Muhammad is the best example for all times to come. They cannot... Okay, can you give me the reference for that? Can you give me the reference for that? 3321. Okay. I mean, it's a common Islamic belief that Muhammad is the best man, and we all know that, right? Right. Is it so... And whatever. Okay, I'm from... I know that one of you is at least from Pakistan, right? Yeah, uh, me. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Pakistan as well. So one okay. thing I would like to shed light on is that in the recent months, ever since the death of that Mullah Khadim Rizvi, mm -hmm. you know him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So his son is about 10 times as big of a, as big of a threat as he was. Have you seen his videos recently? No, I did not. Dude, that motherfucker, I can't even like, begin to fucking... Okay, let me ask you this question. Yeah, Richard, do you think that? Did we finish the first question already about the slaves? We're jumping on another one, and we don't really have time. Uh, uh, Abdullah Gandhi has to go. Yeah, okay, I, I just want, I just want to ask this one. Do you think okay. that being religious is a product of um, lack of intellectual honesty, or do you think it's a product of poverty? It's a very broad question, and I would say so. Religion in its own is an attempt by our ancestors with sincere efforts to understand reality at times. Sometimes some aspects of religion are manipulative, but to say that it's completely and obviously always like uh, intellectually, no, that's not true. That's not the case. I mean, you can find a lot of scientists that are geniuses, Nobel Prize winners that are also religious, and some I know cosmologists who still believe the earth is 6,000 years old. Right? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Abdesan, so they'll be religious people there too. So this is what's called a, a cognitive dissonance or compartmentalization of knowledge where the way you store you, or the way you perceive religion is in, in, a, in a completely different part of your head or in your mind where the critical part of your personality never touches upon it in a way. For example, a quantum physicist can be a Muslim, but he would never really think about the same way about Islam, the way he thinks about quantum mechanics, because, you know, it's in a separate compartment in a way. Uh, so I would say, no, Muslims yeah, they are not. Apply people. the same logic to, to their own beliefs. Okay. Exactly. It's like selective thinking, or we can say that as co cognitive dissonance, right? Um, so, no, yeah, but was, generally there have been papers. As, sorry. Okay, I was very surprised that uh, I was very surprised that Khadim Rizvi's son. I mean, his his party is blowing up right now. There was a recent uh, election in uh, I, sorry, we, don't time, we don't have time for this. Second, and we don't have time for this political discussion. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm not up to date with the Pakistani. Yeah, okay, 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 I'm good. Just uh, let me just time, yes. answer what you said, and, and we're just gonna have to end it on that because uh, okay. So about um, you know the the slavery, I highly recommend you check out to Abdullah's presentation on slavery. Mm -hmm. well, if okay. you have any sort of doubt that this was a good thing, <laughs> watch that two-hour presentation and you will not be able to say Muhammad was a good man. Like, I, I'm not going to repeat okay. all the points for you, but just, just watch that. And um, in regard to... Um, I forgot what the other question was. But anyways, you just, just check that out and you'll see that... I don't know, Pikachu... Uh, sorry, Hakita Ju, what he's saying. Okay. 
But like there's so much bad things, so much evil that happened because of Muhammad's rulings on slavery. There's no way you can justify this man with the best man. There's no way. There's absolutely no way. But anyways, I, I'm not going to repeat myself. Okay, one last thing. Can I just, can I just, one last thing? Gondol's um, up to you. I'm very, yeah. I'm very okay, surprised go. that uh, these people aren't being taken down on YouTube because they are like publicly calling for chopping off heads of blasphemers. They say a phrase like, um, Man Sabba Nabi and Fattulu. Fattulu, yeah. Really trying. Whoever insults so, the prophet, kill him, yeah. Yeah, so how, how are they able to spread hate speech on YouTube and uh, get taken the down? Left, the left has this whole idea that if your religion has hateful ideas, but if you're a minority, you kind of get a free pass on this stuff. So you are they're going to be more lenient towards you. So this is, this is one thing that I've noticed with the media as well. I am uh, just going to make a prediction here. Um, this shit is going to like grow like wild in the coming months and years. Like this is not going to settle down. As well, no, I, I mean, I'm thinking about like uh, my family and friends in Pakistan. They keep telling me like the disparity, the people like I get so many messages. There's like atheism is going nuts in universities and schools in Pakistan. And there's yeah, that's true. Exactly. Like I know so like half men, honestly, like all my class, I found out last year, they're half more than half of them are atheists. Like my classmates from high school. Half of my team. My I have seen people some people like, actually go the other way as well, but I haven't mm -hmm. really talked to them or um, yeah. asked them for their rationality. Okay, I understand your shorter time. Some All right, thank you. thank you yeah, so much. Thanks. thanks. Bye. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm not going to add anybody else because um, we're out of yeah. time. Just add some concluding comments and we'll end it at that. And uh, I'll just go first. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and please do subscribe to the new channel. It's new for a while now, but I guess it's old now. And uh, lots of people today, it was a good call. I think people are looking forward to this and uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue doing it from time to time. Uh, as the schedule goes, we won't be able to take any more callers now. Ap apologies for that. And uh, yeah, final words to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just want to show you guys what I've been up to the past two, three months. So what you're looking at, I don't know if you guys can see it clearly, but these are about 170 items. And uh, this is the research I've been doing. So what you see, these are psychotic Muhammad, the name of the filler. These are symptoms of epilepsy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a search word like fainting faint and just see how many pop up these are the references just for the word fainting at muhammad uh just to show you let's see uh well yeah let's take this one can you see it or no um it's a little bit oh yeah now i can yeah okay. so here like muhammad would faint uh when uh he got the revelation for marrying Zainab, his adopted son's wife. Uh, there is this one from Majma al uh, Like This one's pretty interesting. I'm just going to make this uh, full screen for you guys. Uh, I don't know if you can see that clearly, but it says, that whenever revelation came upon Muhammad, he would faint. Like every time. And he says one of the chains is uh, Sahih. Um, let's write something else. Let's see trembling. Okay, I write trembling, 23 results pop up. I'm just gonna show you a few. Let's see, Tafsir al-Qurtubi. What does this one say? This one says, I'll zoom in a little bit. Okay, it says the Surah Muzammil. So this one says, uh, so Muhammad heard the, heard the voice of an angel. And then he looked at the angel, he was seized by trembling. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to get some that's English. There you go. This one's English. This is from Asbabul Nuzul. Uh, it's for Surah Doha. This is, by the way, this exact one appears in like, oops, seven different uh, tafsirs. And this one says, the Prophet of Allah bless him, gave peace, then came in with his jaw bones trembling. They made fun of me, right? Saying that there's no narrations. I found like three of them. Uh, whenever a revelation came to him, he shivered. Okay. And he said, Oh, hola, cover me, cover me. Uh, there was one that I want to show you the foaming in the mouth as well. Now, these are like six references for that. Uh, 
so long story short, yeah. you have compiled <laughs> you have compiled a database of all sorts of um what would you say like mental health related issues or signs of epilepsy or how do you want to describe it um basically we have yeah symptoms of epilepsy where we have uh auras we have fainting loss of consciousness we have snorting and heavy breathing choking sensations uh, straight up convulsions. Like I'll show you that Sahid narrations where he would straight up just have full on shaking convulsions as well. He would foam and froth at the mouth. There's narrations where he would be sitting here and his buddy would be suddenly, his he head would go up, go down to the ground, fixate on the ground. And then he'd appear to move his lips and talk, then come back and he wouldn't remember what just happened. There's lots of this. He would be constantly taken over by trembling and shaking. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, uh, basically, you have different versions of this pop up. Uh, this one says, just to show you guys, what does Badlahu that he would foam at the mouth uh, when he would be receiving the revelation. Uh, but this is going to be a huge one, as you can see. This is like what? Uh, 170 references. It, nice, nice. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna be a great presentation once you get it done. I'm trying to make like a good video or like I just want to show you one uh, last one and then we will. This one is from. Uh... Okay, yeah, this one. So, uh, what you're looking at is here is this one. When revelation came upon him, he would be seized by a fit, a paroxysm of severity, or a convulsive state, or a highly feverish state. And then it goes and he would start sweating, and then he'd also make the sounds and whatnot. But uh, yeah, this one also is a two, two, three, and that. It uh, talks about the Sanad and whatnot. And Sayyuti said, Varajaluhu Malfikun, that this is in fact a uh, 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 Sahih Hadith. So, and, so anyways. Let's, let's save, yeah, let's save this for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, um, because it'll be more interesting, I think, when we add the commentary and we show it with exactly. explanation and put it in, in its proper place and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, any any final words for today? Um, Circus of Islam number three plus lots of calls. <laughs> um, I have blocked one Dawa because he's being a little jerk as usual. He's on his Twitter bragging about how I'm so scared of him. <laughs> Honestly, people spend all the energy talking about drama like this. You know they're not engaging in good faith. Like I want to engage with people like Jalal who calls in, and I knew already one Dawa, I, I remember that I had a bad experience with this guy, but like Jalal, he comes on and he's asking us questions. We're having a conversation. We're respectful of each other. That's the type of content that I want to encourage. Not this like Muhammad hijab shouting at speaker's corner, you know, like shouting over each other or like the way he does debates where he basically straw mans, you know, he straw man David Wood and misrepresented what he was saying multiple times. This type of, these type of people, like they're not like, who wants to engage with people like that and if someone's gonna say well you also did some shitty things you know he, he brought up the george floyd i made this dumb joke on twitter where i said muhammad was uh you know choked in the cave by the angel and i realized after that it was disrespectful to george floyd and the fact that he died and the wool you know movement of black lives matter so i apologize for it. it in no way i was actually being disrespectful to that but i was i was making a dumb joke about muhammad that's all it was right? it was a petty petty joke but anyways the point is like he there's engaged i have done stupid things like that too so if someone for example farid or anybody wants to say i don't want to talk to a hakika i don't want to talk to abdullah because he's a prick and he makes stupid jokes about a prophet i would say i respect that that's your prerogative. Hamza Suetis might say you're a troll. If he thinks I'm a troll or Jonathan Brown doesn't want to talk to me or Yasakari, that's up to them. Like that is how, but if you're going to go on someone's stream, debate me, debate me, debate me, you're a coward. You can't, like, how desperate are you? Like how needy are you for attention that you can't just make your own content. If you want to refute me, go ahead and refute me on your channel. 
tafaddal, like you're most welcome. But if you're going to come on someone else's show and desperately beg for it and then go on Twitter and say, oh, look, he's scared. Like, I don't want to talk to people like that, man. <laughs> Just do your own thing. You know, you're most welcome. Go ahead. I, I don't care. I'm not going to engage with you. Like, you're most welcome. Do your own thing. That's it. That's all I have to say about that incident. Um, and um, and it's unfortunate, you know, that one Dawa made a video where he took Shabil Ali. Shabil Ali is actually like a good Muslim scholar. He is someone that has, you know, reflecting on Islam and actually some of his positions are actually quite reasonable. Like you shouldn't kill apostates. You know, that like stoning is now part of Islam. That if you want to pay, you, you're not allowed to pay interest. You're not allowed to accept interest because the Quran says those who consume riba, but you can pay interest and get a mortgage. So he's actually helping Muslims to have like a somewhat reasonable life. Right? And these guys, they made a compilation. Mandawa made a compilation of him, like putting all of these things together to try to make him look like he's uh, like an apostate or something, or he's a terrible Muslim. And they're trying to get him canceled in the Muslim community. And then Hakuju his video and it blow, blow it up even more the funny thing is is it this is how i see it and i don't know how when muslims are going to realize this the whole dava scene is being ruined by immature teenagers absolutely i'm not even joking uh you have and i will tell you this there are people who are nice who are scholars or academics people like yasir qadi when they voice an opinion that okay some Ulama didn't consider this as shirk. It has to be taken that he's voicing other people's opinion. It does not necessitate that everybody starts refuting Yasir Qadi. Now the Shabir Ali is gone. Who's next? Dr. Zakir Naik is going to be attacked. He's already been attacked. And then... Yeah, is another Salafi that, yeah, he's... But the point is, is what these people need to do is learn to put their differences aside and get together instead of takfiring each other all the time. Like, come on. (laughs) They make the community, they look, they project their own sectarianism to the world to see. Yeah. Right? Like, it, yeah. It, this whole thing, this whole thing started because of Farid. Farid was trying to be the... Oh, the, 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 the and this whole holes in the narrative, the amount of people that left Islam because of this, the amount of damage to the yeah. power, all because you're trying to refute your fellow Muslim scholar because you can't accept a little bit of difference of opinion. And you're exactly. trying to make... Like this puritanness are going to destroy Islam and they're going to throw more people out of Islam and mm-hmm. go ahead like yeah. keep doing, keep acting like little you know trolls mm-hmm. or whatever and <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's funny like what we need is we need more people like Shabir Ali and Yasser Qadi to be at the forefront and taking control of the Dawah movement and whatnot and being the leaders but in fact we have these unqualified email leaking <laughs> disrespectful people jumping and just making refutation video after refutation video yeah and, and what you will see now i'm actually also preparing a big refutation against the dr farid al khadja or uh, uh, farid's cousin the neurologist I have oh yeah two, two neurologists on my side as well as an md that'll be coming on to help me out as well when we explain this but the point is like just to show you they the guy comes in says oh it's gondol's opinion don't listen to him the but no, I told you in my stream, like, no, listen, these are epileptologists written books. I will literally hold the books in my hand and show you. A yeah. point is that, like, it's some, the Dawah scene has become very reactionary and it's yeah. all about nitpicking negativities. There's no positive coming out of it. You're just creating a toxic environment where if anybody takes one word or one step wrong, kafir or shirk, like, that's not how it's done. And you don't come on like, yeah, Sarkadi is like, Astaghfirullah, the deviant, the zindik, he's going to ruin the ummah. Yani, bro, he did so much, so much <laughs> work for the ummah. He's helped so... I don't know, I feel like I'm, I'm being an apologist for Saudi <laughs> right now, honestly. It's <laughs> true. Like these, it's... People, these people are saving. Mufti Abu Layth, Yasakari, and uh, Shabir Ali are, are keeping people Muslim. But these fanatics, these extremists, these hardcore Salafis are ever increasingly making the ummah smaller and smaller until mm-hmm. everybody's out of Islam. And and I wonder like if they're going to push someone badly enough that these people will actually publicly leave Islam. I don't know. Maybe a day is going to come where they like attack like Shibir Ali and Shibir Ali is like, I don't want anything to do with you guys. It's this weird idea of like, you know, the Ghuraba concept that over time the righteous people will like reduce and it'll be like holding a coal in your hand and you'll be the Ghuraba and the daughter fitness so they have this weird mentality of self-righteousness where like okay anybody is gonna say anything like remotely we off the manhaj 
takfir it's just it's 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 like it's i feel bad what i'm trying to say is even as an ex-muslim i know that the muslim community has scholars and individuals that are more mature and should be representing the muslim community in a much more fair manner like these ali davas these muhammad hijabs honestly they're only famous on youtube most yeah. of the people the ulama the sheikhs at the mosque they're not yeah like these guys they're yeah. decent mature people yeah they don't yeah. Yeah, behave in and like especially people like Dr. Yasser Qadi, like even though I disagree with him, he's a, still a scholar. And for them to pick on his evolution as a person over 20 years, like his facial look change and whatnot, it's immature, you know. Like the yeah. Muslim Twitter, Muslim YouTube become obsessed with like even against us, all they do is they keep making memes about us. They don't really engage just they just memes. You're this, I'm this, I'm a donkey, and you're, <laughs> you're something. And yeah. this is the problem, right? And well, they're giving us free publicity. Yeah, Anyways. yeah. Like, and and you'll notice that people like that, the type of crowd they have, they have mm-hmm. this like immature loser crowd, <laughs> debunked, wrecked, you know, <laughs> this type of people. Um, so it is what it is. If that's the if that's the audience they want to build, I mean, the, they can build that. I don't really care. Yeah, uh, I do. I think people do need to understand that everyone, Muslim and non-Muslim, has a right to decide who to engage with. Like, it just sometimes, sometimes you wonder though. Like when, when you know, sometimes you, you we do have a right to call out people when they say we're inviting atheists to call in. Like for example, the SC Dawa or Hamza's Den has an open call-in show, and they explicitly only allow white atheists and not ex-Muslim atheists. You can ask why do you guys uh why are you guys not allowing us to to call in? I mean that's like I allowed one Dawa to come and then he started being a like again grandstanding, no content, no actual um substance. I'm like okay, I don't want to talk to you, but I wasn't gonna do that. I was gonna call you know hundreds. Someone asked a Muslim asked me to call in. I was gonna ask him a question about apostasy, and I would have engaged with them. And there was like there's an all star team, man. They had Muhammad Hijab, Hamza Soitis, uh, Subul. They had um, like uh, Mansoor. They had a bunch of people that like they have way more experience than me in having these conversations and debates. I barely talk to Muslims because Muslims don't call. Not many Muslims don't call in. These guys are in speakers corner. They would have outgunned me for sure. Six versus one. Yet still, they didn't want me to call. Now that you got to wonder. It didn't even give me a chance. Like, okay, if I showed up and said, why are you guys scared of me? Okay, if they kick me out, I, I would expect that. But to kind of a you know, so sometimes we do have a point that there is a question to be asked: Why are you guys scared, or why are you guys avoiding this? But when you have people like this that are just being like, you know, petty and like last time as well, we allowed some guy to come to call in, and the first question he asked, Gondal, why are you running away?" I'm like, "This is the type of people that call in, like, we're allowing you to call in and you're asking why we're running away." <laughs> that, like, yeah. does that make any sense? You're here. Use, you know use that. Use yeah. that. Like, you, you could have asked a question about miracles or something, right? Like, use, use yeah. the platform to your benefit. And anyway, so anyways, I think we've gone on for too long. I apologize mm-hmm. for keeping you and everyone else for uh, whoever was was been here from the beginning. Uh, thank you guys, all of you guys, and uh, hopefully we'll have another one soon. And uh, stay safe and uh, see you. Uh, see you later. Bye. Bye bye.